Hello, we just let uh, somebody from Madera Irrigation District, or at least I assume that's the MID in, and the computer is simply named MID. Um, once you pair up to an audio, we're gonna ask you to identify yourself just so we can tie that particular device to a speaker name in the Zoom meeting. So I just invited uh, the individual with the Madeira ID uh, to unmute. If you could let us know who you are, so we can associate you with the speaker card. Uh, yes, this is um, this is MID, and it will include uh, John Kinsey, Tommy Gracie, and Dina Nolan. Okay, and great. You're all three on Brian, one device. And and of course, uh, Brian, Brian Davis, if he's able to make it. Okay. Thanks. Great, thank you. Chair Escobel, it looks like you have a quorum, and if you'd like, you're welcome to begin. Thank you, Mr. Lawfer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Escobel, I'm Chair of the State Water Board. Today is Tuesday, October 20th. It is 9.30, and I would like to call this meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues. With me today is Vice Chair Doreen Diodamo, Board Member Laurel Firestone, Board Member uh, Tam Dodek, and Board Member Sean McGuire. 
Assisting today uh, as well, us, our, our staff, Executive Director Eileen Sobeck, our two Chief Deputies, Eric Oppenheimer and Jonathan Bishop, our Chief Counsel, Michael Laufer, uh, the uh, Clerk of the Board is Janine Townsend, as, and assisting her is Margie Argel. As you all well know, this meeting is being webcast and recorded, and in order to comply with the Governor's uh, distancing orders and COVID uh, uh, regulations, if you will, we are, of course, hosting this, this board meeting remotely. We don't have a physical board meeting room and are taking public comment here on the Zoom platform. For those of you who are viewing us perhaps through the webcast on the Cal EPA website or YouTube and intend to comment on one of our items today, uh, you need to be here in the platform with us. Instructions to do so are at the top of today's agenda, but you can also send an email to comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov and be given uh, the password and link to join us here on the platform for comment. Uh, until your item and you are called up to comment on your item, uh, you will be muted, your video will be off, uh, and you will be uh, invited to unmute and uh, share your video when the time is uh, upon us. So with that, we actually are beginning uh, today's uh, board meeting with a, a Superior Accomplishment Team Award and would like to call up Leslie Loudon uh, to uh, deliver that award here. Good morning, Ms. Loudon. Okay, good morning. Good morning, Chair Escavel and board members. I'm Leslie Loudon, Deputy Director of the Division of Financial Assistance. And I'm pleased to be here today to present a Superior Accomplishment Team Award. But because the team is uh, fairly large, I have a short presentation, so I could include pictures of the team members since we couldn't really have them all on the Zoom meeting. Um, they don't all have cameras, but I do have the team leaders, Megan Tosney and Wendy Westerman here with us on the Zoom. So this Superior Accomplishment Award is for our Drinking Water for Schools team. I'll give you a little bit of background on the program and the accomplishments of the team and then introduce all the team members. Next slide, please. So the Drinking Water for Schools program was one of the first of a series of budget augmentations we received for specific drinking water uses. Its purpose was to improve access to and the quality of, of drinking water in schools. It started as a general fund appropriation, but then it was moved into the Department of Education's budget during the conference committee in 2016. So the appropriation provided nine and a half million dollars for grants to local educational agencies including individual schools and districts. And then we also received $500,000 for technical assistance, but we had to use a competitive bid contract process to award those funds. And that's a longer process than a typical technical assistance grant award. So we did not receive any staff resources to administer the program. So we had to absorb the workload using our existing resources. Next slide. So since it was a new program with new stakeholders, the team had to quickly do outreach and coordination with the Department of Education and educational organizations to develop the program guidelines. The board adopted the guidelines in May of 2017, and we opened a nine month continuous solicitation for schools serving small disadvantaged communities. So the proposals kind of trickled in initially and then flooded in at the end of the nine months, which is fairly typical. <laughs> so the team had to quickly review all of the proposals and 76 projects were awarded funds. So the team had a compressed time frame to get the projects into grant agreements. And at the same time, the division was struggling to transition. Next slide. <clears throat> So to accomplish the work, the team had to develop new templates and adopt new approaches to executing these agreements. The teamwork included close coordination with the Department of Education and also the Division of the State Architect within the um, Department of General Services. The team created the Drinking Water for Schools Countdown Board, which is shown in the picture on the left. And every time an agreement was executed, a numbered sheet was torn off and the countdown board was visible across the entire floor and it really, really served to boost team morale. 
And it was it was hard for me to resist running up to the 17th floor every time we executed an agreement to see the sheet torn off. It was it was a lot of fun. Next slide. So the team met all of the encumbrance deadlines and got all of the funds put to the intended use. Over 100 schools received new drinking water facilities and thousands of children have improved drinking water access and quality as a result of the team's work. Next slide. So this slide shows how impactful the, the funds were for some of the schools. This improvised drinking water station, as the recipient called it, that's shown on the left, was replaced with an actual sanitary drinking water fountain and bottle filling station in the playground areas. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'd like to introduce the team members. The technical part of the drinking water for schools team consisted of the following individuals, Megan Tosney, Kim Hannigan, Ravi Jawanda, Christina Raynard, Mark Fong, Alex Hong, and Kristen Torres. Next slide. And the administrative team consists of Wendy Westerman, Lisa Labrado, Lily Lee, Patty Eide, Andrew Hoekstra, Anna Petrosian, and Amy, Amy, Amy Sunahara of the Cleanup and Abatement Unit, Debbie Chung, Carrie Holtzgang, Keisha Kelly, Melissa Miller, Roxanne McElpine, and Dominique Brown of the Grants and Contracts Unit, and Taylor Stevens, Jeff O'Connor, and Fatima Martinez of our admin unit. Next. So as you can see, it was a great team effort and truly worthy endeavor. The staff really went above and beyond by squeezing in these tasks on top of their other work. They worked under short timeframes and with recipients which were inexperienced and new to our processes. And so with that, I'd like to congratulate the team and thank the Drinking Water for Schools team. I do have Megan Tosney and Wendy Westerman here on the Zoom to receive the awards on behalf of the team. So we can give them the, you know, virtual applause as we do. <laughs> so thank you. <clears throat> Fantastic. It's incredible work. You know, I think oftentimes uh, we forget that the Division of Financial Assistance is actually our largest by staff and do incredible work on the daily. And to your point, uh, Leslie, oftentimes are given direction uh, from the legislature or programs without necessarily additional staffing and needing to kind of pack in the work to existing workloads. So thank you, Men, uh, uh, Megan and Wendy. And please, do you have uh, anything anything to say here? Um, just, you know, to congratulate the team, it really was a team effort more than I've seen on a lot of other things that we've worked on in the division. So thank you to everyone for just sort of pitching in and doing your part. And I'll just add that the admin team working with the technical team um, really pulled together and got in a lab and figured out how to enter fiscal. It was a great learning experience for us. It's twofold. We got a lot of experience in fiscal right at the beginning. So it was kind of a pressure situation that really they, they came together, they were excited about it and uh, congratulations. I'll just add my thanks because I was so impressed that we actually were able to do this number and, um, you know, it's such an important program and I think made a huge impact uh, for, for students and, and teachers around the state, but also just a huge feat. I frankly was uh, totally surprised that we were able to do that, especially with Fiscal. So I'm so glad there's this, um, ability to and you know nomination ability to recognize the team and really really grateful yeah thank you. thank you thank you guys so much really appreciate it. wish we could celebrate you all in person here uh but at least appreciate this moment to uh, acknowledge what as as board member firestone said is really just incredible work under an amazing deadline and just quietly got it done um mm -hmm. and so i uh, really really appreciate being able to acknowledge you all here and look forward to the continued great work of the Division of Financial Assistance. So thanks, you guys. Thank you. Well, fantastic. And with that done, uh, we now move on to our public forum. And public forum is an opening at the beginning of the board meeting to, uh, for individuals of the public to speak on any item not uh, currently uh, before the board. And I think first we have up uh, Mr. Jonathan Yates from Bring Back the Current Committee. Mr. Yates. 
It should be ask what there you are. Good morning. My name is Gates, and I'm proud to call Bakersfield my home. I'm here to speak out in support of the city of Bakersfield's efforts to restore water to the Kern River through our city. The fact that the riverbed remains dry in all but the wettest of years, while the river's water is transported in concrete canals parallel to the river, is a grave insult to this mighty river. The lack of water for half a million residents living in Bakersfield and for wildlife dependent on the river corridor is one of the greatest environmental justice problems on any California river. Time passes slowly for those of us who are waiting for the Kern River to flow again. As of last month, it has been 50 years since the city council of Bakersfield first took action to purchase substantial rights to the Kern's flows which had all been privately owned since the historic Miller-Hagen Agreement of 1888. Bakersfield residents were told that once the purchase was paid off via water sales contracts, our river would be reborn. In 2000, taxpayers passed Proposition 13 and Bakersfield residents were promised a flowing river with those funds. No river ever materialized from that money. In 2007, Kern Delta Water District forfeited 50,000 acre feet of water and the city of Bakersfield applied for the water rights to run that water through the riverbed, which gave us hope that we would finally have our river again. In 2010, the water board ruled that the Kern was not fully appropriated. No action has been taken since then by the board to reallocate the unappropriated or forfeited water of the Kern. And in the meantime, that water is instead going to other water users and not traveling through our river channel to get to those users. In 2011, the water contracts from the original Kern River purchase expired and it seemed that at last Bakersfield would have a river. Instead, a judge ruled that restoring the Kern River, ruled against restoring the Kern River and ordered Bakersfield to continue selling water under the 1976 contract. A generation of people has come and gone waiting for the return of the river. A generation full of frustration and disappointment for the Kern River. Residents of Bakersfield have had enough waiting. We can't wait indefinitely for bureaucrats and lawyers to bring back the Kern. We are petitioning directly to the board to address this environmental injustice now. As of this morning, nearly 3,600 people have signed our petition and we will continue to gather signatures until we have a flowing river. Signers of the petition are asking the board to award the forfeited Kern Delta rights to Bakersfield, to allow Bakersfield to use the water it already owns in the riverbed as an approved beneficial use, and to put pressure on the Kern County Water Agency to uphold their promises to help restore the river with the infrastructure they purchased with Prop 13 dollars. The board was petitioned by Bakersfield residents back when the Kern Delta water was first forfeited. Whether or not that influenced the board's ruling, only the board can say. But in the intervening years since that petition, Bakersfield residents have been mostly silent, anxiously waiting for the promised return of the river. This time is different. We are not going away and we're not going to be silent. We will continue to build support from within and outside our community for the cause of bringing back the Kern. We know that we are in the right and that history is on our side. If Mono Lake can be saved, the Owens can be restored and the San Joaquin can flow again, we will bring back the Kern. We know we have power to influence the outcome and to restore water to our river, but we are appealing to you, members of the board, because you have the most power to influence the outcome in favor of the river. We need your help. We know you have a multitude of other problems to deal with across the state, but we need you to prioritize Bakersfield's river. It's time to put the Kern River back on the board's agenda and to make the decisions the board has been delaying for over a decade. You owe it to this mighty river and to the people of Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Yates. I appreciate you coming to the board this morning and uh, addressing and bringing to, to light the issues of uh, the Kern River. Um, it looks like we have uh, six additional speakers that will also be speaking on the Kern River here. So uh, we can move on uh, to the next uh, speaker. And again, thank you, Mr. Gates. Next, I believe we have uh, Mr. Richard O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill, we've invited you to unmute your microphone. Um, we will send again. You'll need to acknowledge. Okay, okay there you go. 
Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. My name is Richard O'Neill. Yes, I'm, I'm calling from Bakersfield, the home of the Kern River. And I'm representing the Kern River Parkway Foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. And uh, I'm asking specifically for the board to address the 50,000 acre feet of unappropriated water and granted to the city of Bakersfield, which is the only applicant that has promised to run it down the riverbed. We ask that the board grant the water to the city of Bakersfield, who's the only one that's ready to to distribute and share this water with the with the other districts. Only the city has agreed to run it down the riverbed and recharge the aquifers. It'll increase our quality of life down here, allows Bakersfield to grow properly, gives us US, gives us recreation sources, and waters the riparian forest, flora and fauna, and wildlife along the river. Please help us to bring our water back to back to the Kern River bed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you for taking the time and joining us this morning. I appreciate your comments. Uh, next, we have uh, Annie uh, Latch. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My last, oh, my, my last name was, Thank that's you. okay. Uh, yes, my name is Annie Vlock, and I am here to speak to restoring water to the Kern River as well. Uh, Jonathan has the facts and figures, but I would like to address it from a more personal nature. Um, I've been a resident of this area since 1994, so for 26 years I have been aware of the Kern River. Um, I have run and biked and hiked on that Kern River Parkway from Enos Lane to Lake Mead. Not only have I been on the, the uh, parkway, um, I have paddle boarded on our river. I have kayaked and, sounds very redneck, but I actually have inner tubed on the Kern River. I actually took a paddle board from Lake Mead all the way to Riverwalk Park. Um, that required getting out of the river quite a few times. It was an epic adventure that I will never do again, but it really actually gave me a good view of our river and a lot of um, ways that it is used and actually a lot of ways that it's blocked off from our public. But I um, very much love the places where it is available for public use. Um, I actually <laughs> am an avid outdoors person um, I've been where the water comes from the Kern River. I've hiked Mount Whitney. I've hiked the forks of the Kern. And I'm pretty passionate about this uh, little body of water. Um, I believe that there is a physical effect on the city as some have addressed the wildlife, the birds, the trees. But there's also a psychological effect of water running through a city. Um, I own a little house downtown, so I can easily get to the bike path within half a mile, which I regularly do. But our family also owns a little ranch up in the mountains and it has a creek that runs through it. It's not the Kern River, it's not the same body of water, it is seasonal. But I've experienced firsthand what happens when water runs through an area. The birds are there, the plants are there, but it also has a psychological effect. Lately, I've gotten involved with the Kern River Parkway Foundation and had the opportunity to clean up down in our dry riverbed. Um, so a certain kind of wildlife has left, but we have a quote, different kind of wildlife um, inhabiting the Kern River park, uh, bed where we recently, um, picked up garbage. I'm sure that anyone that has used that area can see the incredible amount of 
damage that has been done by the garbage being left there. And I would make the case that that psychological effect is kind of along the lines of the broken window theory, if you're familiar with that, that supposes that visible signs of crime and disorder um, create an urban environment that encourages more disorder. So to me, having water flowing through the riverbed creates an effect in our city that you can't really measure. There is something life-giving when the water flows through the city. It gives life to plants, trees, and birds, but I think that it is also life-giving to the city itself. Um, most of us have driven over that bridge on the 99, probably more times than we can possibly count. And maybe a lot of people don't notice when they are driving over that dry riverbed, um, but I do. And I believe that whether you consciously notice it or not, that having water flowing through our city actually makes possible that motto that Bakersfield has had posted, Bakersfield, life as it should be. And without that river, I think that it, um, we're not really living up to that motto. Thank you for your time. Thank you for yours and for your, your advocacy and coming before the board this morning. It's really uh, critical and, and appreciated. So thank you. You're uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Kelly Damien. Good morning, Ms. Damien. I should Good be morning. Asking. Good morning. So thank you for having me today. I'm also going to be speaking on um, restoring water to the Kern River. I'm a teacher and a, and a writer here in Kern County, and I also have kids. So, you know, my perspective is kind of building on, on the other people's perspective here. Um, so in our river's current state, uh, most days the river is more of a river bed than a river. But, you know, it worked out for us that this spring, right when COVID hit and the shutdown started and everybody was very scared and cooped up, there was water in our river during that time. So I took my kids to the river during at that point. And I like to go at the space between Allen Road and Enos Lane because there's this beach right there. And so I can sit on the beach and I'll watch my kids go around in the inner tubes. Um, and there's this rope swing over on the side where there's this gully. And so the kids, you know, every year people like continually add to this rope swing. It's like this ongoing project. So like there's a platform and there's a new rope and then someone adds a handle and then the kids come and they're like swinging off. And so it was this very lovely day and very lovely experience. But what I noticed was all the people who came to the river during that time. And it wasn't just me from my neighborhood. It was on that same day, there was these group of teenagers playing on the rope swing. There was also a family with, with uh, Spanish speaking toddlers all together, very excited going down the river. There was a family who had a special needs son with them. People had picnics and pop-ups and everybody's going down to, to enjoy the water. And the reason why I felt so happy to see the kids playing in the river and to see this big cross section of people who were coming down to the river when there's water in it is because it's really not easy being a kid in Bakersfield. One in three children in Kern County live in poverty. Only 25% of Kern County seventh graders could pass standards for physical fitness. And in 2017, our local pediatricians were told to start screening children for toxic levels of stress. This is in our county. Um, when we have water in our river, that provides a free place to play. It's open to everybody. The kids can exercise. They're connecting with their friends and family. It's, it's a very equal opportunity playground where everyone is welcome. It's not the same when it's just the riverbed. Um, when there is no river, when there is no water in the river and the temperatures are high, we all have our workarounds. The people who have means will go to their swimming pools and swim in their swimming pools. You know, kids will turn on a hose in the front yard. 
But unfortunately, something else that happens is that people go to Hart Park and they go to the North Kern where it is very dangerous. Every single year, people die going into the river in the places where it is unsafe. When you run the water through the city, it's in, it is the safest part of the river. It's incredibly wide. There are no boulders. There's nothing to get snagged on. The water is only a few feet deep, which is perfect for paddling and for young children. Um, this, and again, like running this directly through the city, right where it is at everybody's fingertips, it gives those, those families a safe place to be outside, to connect with nature, to experience this sense of pride and a real sense of community because we have this beautiful thing in our city. I just really want to point out today how hard the people of Kern County work for California. The people in this county, they work the crops, they work in the fields, they pump the oil, they drive the trucks up and down the state. You know, we even soak up a lot of the pollution from the coastal areas. And so, you know, you're welcome, but <laughs> um, the, the people of this county really do deserve to have their river back. This is not a matter of aesthetics. This is a genuine matter of social justice. So thank you for listening to me today. Thank you as well, Ms. Damien, for joining folks and uh, advocating and giving voice to the challenges and issues in Bakersfield. Um, I'll just note, um, I, I, my family comes from Bakersfield. The Esquivels are, are settled there. Um, and so uh, just really appreciate uh, taking the time today. So thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Leah Mendez. Good morning. Morning. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just practically moved to tears by the people who have already spoken about um, the effort to restore water to the Kern River. And um, I'm just going to add my own little piece about that. So my name is Leah Mendez, and I am very proud to say that I was born and raised in Bakersfield, California. A lot of people I've met over the years who come from other parts of the state act kind of surprised when I talk about my hometown with pride. Oh, they might say in a tone kind of equally, you know, of disgust and pity, I'm sorry. And believe it or not, that's actually one of the more polite responses I've heard. I've heard other people say, oh, Bakersfield, isn't that the armpit of the state? Uh, now, I love my hometown and I love it even more fiercely every time I hear someone try to tear it down. And as frustrating as, and as hurtful as these comments can be, I try to see those exchanges as opportunities to educate people who are just misinformed because my Bakersfield is home to the Kern River. And, when that water flows, my town is paradise. And you can tell I feel strongly about this because I can't help it but feel overwhelmed with emotion. That water makes life possible, not just for plants, animals, the thousands of migrating birds who call that place home throughout the year, some of these species which are threatened or endangered, but that water makes life more livable for us too. And, the Bakersfield that I want to share with people is the Bakersfield that has a free flowing Kern River. But it's challenging for me to do that when for a majority of the year, the landscape lives up to its reputation. It's a dry riverbed running through a parched and lifeless town. The good news is it doesn't have to be this way which is why I'm here today in support of the movement to restore water to the Kern River. Um, I'm actually speaking to you uh, from Missoula, Montana. It's been two months since I moved here to attend a two-year graduate program in environmental studies at the University of Montana. And it was a really difficult decision to make to uproot and leave my hometown, uh, but ultimately it feels like the right call when I imagine all of the knowledge and skills that I'll be able to bring home to Bakersfield one day. And in the meantime, Missoula itself has proven to be so enormously inspiring. 
of what is possible when a community values its river. When I first got here in August, there were people tubing, stand up paddle boarding, even fly fishing right in the middle of town where the Clark Fork runs through Missoula. And witnessing the community spirit and the amount of tourism that generated with this vibrant Clark Fork River running through town, I just couldn't help but think this could be Bakersfield. And that's my dream for my hometown and only water will make it possible. So I thank you so much for your time and so much for uh, for witnessing, you know, like what, again, I, I have a lot of emotion tied up in this. So thank you so much. And thank you to all the speakers. You guys are speaking so much truth. It's, it's beautiful. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mendez. Really appreciate you joining and the, the giving voice to a community. And uh, again, emphasizing that there is an incredible life there. Um, and it is unfortunate that oftentimes uh, that communities are disparaged and there isn't a community in California that is deserving of any of that disparaging. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for your passion and for joining us this morning. If I might add. Yes, please. Yes. When you do return to Bakersfield with your uh, additional experience and knowledge, please look up the Central Valley Regional Water Board office in Bakersfield. We do have uh, offices there. I have no idea, you know, what your interests are in terms of your future work, but it seems like from your excitement, from your commitment, from your enthusiasm for the river, uh, for water issues, for societal issues, um, please look us up. In the yeah, meantime, best wishes with your studies. Yes, Ms. Mendez, we look forward to your return to the state and bringing back those, those skills uh, here to us. So just thank you. Uh, next is, uh, we'll call up uh, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Nava or Nava. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name's Stephanie and I'm a Bakersfield resident and Zulcher. And I would like the water to be back in the river for recreational reasons, um, ecological reasons. It's very unfortunate when I have um, new residents that move into Bakersfield from out of state, out of city, asking, you know, what can we do in Bakersfield? And I say the Kern River, you know, the Kern River is a great place to go enjoy with your family, you know, just go relax. And it's really unfortunate when um, they only see what's available, which is um, the Hart Park area, which is very dangerous. Um, so those are the reasons why I would really appreciate, you know, if we could have the river back in our town. Um, I've been living in Bakersfield for nine years and I've got to enjoy some of the river. And it's, it's pretty embarrassing to not be able to have a river um, and just have a dry bed. So I appreciate your time and thanking you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you for joining us this morning and giving voice to the community here. Uh, last, we have Eduardo Vargas. And so Chair Esquivel, um, Mr. Vargas has uh, not uh, come into the Zoom platform, but we do have okay. at least one individual who we cannot tie to a speaker card. So Mr. Vargas, if you happen to be on the meeting, if you can use the Zoom feature to raise your hand, uh, you should see it as one of the options across the bottom of the bar, and we can try to identify you. Otherwise, we will move on. Yes, and Mr. Vargas, if you're actually watching from uh, either the Cal EPA webcast or the YouTube feed and aren't here on the platform, uh, do uh, follow the instructions to get on or email uh, comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov. Otherwise, though, um, we will move on. Uh, Okay, with that then, um, we will, uh, that concludes public comment. And thank you uh, for those that um, have provided uh, comment here during public forum. Next, uh, we'll move on to, uh, I believe one moment, let me make sure I have my agenda up. Um, yes, uh, consideration and adoption of the previous meetings, uh, board minutes meetings. So I will entertain a motion for folks. Move for adoption of the minutes. Second. Great, thank you, Ms. Townsend. Can you please call a roll call vote? Certainly. Board Member Dodek? 
Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Board Member Firestone. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. I'll be abstaining. I wasn't present at the last board meeting. Okay. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. The vote carries and the board meeting minutes are adopted, everyone. Uh, thank you. Next, we move, we'll move on to a couple of informational items. Uh, item number two is an update on the board's actions and responses to COVID-19. Uh, I think I'll kick it over to our executive director, Eileen Sobeck. Good morning, Ms. Sobeck. Good morning, um, Chair Escobar and board members. Um, Max Gomberg is gonna give you an update in a minute, but I think the short version is that we've um, made a lot of progress um, in the last couple of weeks. We've had um, at least one meeting with um, some of our stakeholders. We're very close to finalizing the um, questions that would go out in a survey and our sampling methodology and sampling size. And I think that we um, now believe that um, water board staff will be able to uh, personally reach out via telephone um, regarding to try to get responses, a higher response rate um, from your request. So we're, we have another meeting scheduled um, this week to try to wrap up the schedule, the questions, the, the methodology, we'll be getting our staff trained up and we're hoping um, to start the actual survey work um, um, at the, the first two weeks of November. Um, so we should have a good notion um, during the course of November, you know, around Thanksgiving about whether we're getting um, an adequate response to this sort of second phase of a voluntary um, survey. And we will report back to you, obviously, if we're not there. But um, Max Gomberg has a few more, few more details and we're happy to um, answer any questions, although we don't really have, um, you know, we obviously don't have any results for you right now. Thank you, Ms. Sobeck. And before Mr. Gomberg, you begin, I do want to acknowledge, I think Mr. Vargas um, is uh, is here uh, has from the previous item. What I'll flag is we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, have this conversation. And if if it makes sense, Mr. Vargas, we can uh, have you provide your, your comment in between this item and then the start of the next item, if, if that makes sense. This shouldn't be too long, so it'll just okay. be- That sounds good. Yeah. Okay, and so Mr. Vargas, we'll, we'll take your public comment, like I said, uh, after we finish up this COVID item and before we move on to item number three. So thank you. And uh, Mr. Gomberg. And I'll be brief. Um, the things I have to add are that I think we're, as uh, Executive Director Sobek mentioned, um, we should be um, on track to have a, a good amount of data coming in in November. Uh, and so we would uh, come back to you uh, to report on our progress uh, at the first December board meeting is what we're thinking at the moment. Uh, and then just to give some general idea of what we're looking at, we're looking at uh, a little over 500, between 500 and, and 600 total systems that would be responding. That would be small systems and large systems uh, so that we can know again, two things uh, for the smaller systems, their financial standing uh, and, and level of uh, losses. Um, and then uh, for all systems, for customers, how much debt is accumulating and, and what does that debt look like uh, as we move through this crisis? So um, as, as you heard, we're, we're on track and um, I, I do expect this effort to uh, provide us the data that, that uh, the board is seeking. Well, great. I um, just want to thank everyone for the good quick work. I know there's been a, a couple of meetings these last couple couple of weeks with uh, the member agencies and, and some of the groups and associations and NGOs uh, uh, really tied to the effort here. And just want to thank everyone for their, their good participation in those discussions, the commitment to get this information, the, the acknowledgement that it's critical to, to get this data point and understand how much debt is accruing in households, the impact to systems, so that we can get on to what are uh, much more difficult policy discussions ultimately on how we actually ameliorate uh, what it is that we're finding. But just being able to assess and understand the scale and scope of the issues in the state are gonna be really critical. So just wanna thank everyone for quickly doing that. Um, any questions from fellow board members? You know, I think what I would like to do as we, uh, you know, I know at this point, it's gonna be staff really getting trained up, beginning to make the calls. As uh, uh, Director Sovic said, we'll be hearing here in November, understanding, okay, are we getting the responses we need? Will we be making 
this goal to get this data by the end of the year. Um, and we'd just like to direct then uh, Sean uh, McGuire and, and Laurel Firestone, our two board members here, uh, to, 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 to carry on for us to, as board to kind of bird dog, if you will, uh, the, the effort as it unfolds and meet with external groups uh, continuing if, if need be there. Um, you know, I, I think similarly uh, to some of our uh, discussions around the cost of compliance and, and exploring projects there that I know uh, board member Doduk and, and Vice Chair Diodamo are, are undertaking. And, and here similarly, I think uh, board member McGuire and board member Firestone would, would do us well to kind of continue to, to monitor the situation, if you will, the, for us as a board and uh, help report back uh, anything that any any developments, but it's sounding like we're on a, a good path and are are due to get some data here and are looking forward to the follow on discussions that certainly that will uh, create for us. The, any questions from board members though on updates uh, on the COVID item here? I was just going to add uh, thanks to staff and um, to you chair Esquivel for um, really uh, leading this, the follow-up, quick follow-up after the last board meeting um, and stakeholders uh, that were able to all pull together some meetings really fast. Um, and I appreciate circling back this quick. Um, and, you know, I know I look forward to working with Sean and continue and the other stakeholders and making sure that we can move this quickly and effectively. I think we set last time our commitment to ensuring that we get this, that we get it by the, that, that we get this characterization by the end of the year and that we, you know, set these kind of timelines and milestones um, so that we can circle back uh, to make sure we're on track. And so I appreciate that kind of outline from staff on um, timing and, um, you know, an opportunity to, to circle back with this board on um, progress before it's end of the year so we can make sure that we're on track so appreciate it and looking forward to it and and um, looking forward to working together with uh the many stakeholders that i think it's going to take to get this done and also just appreciate the huge lift that staff is investing in in this yeah I, i'll just i'll just echo those comments and i'm more than happy to help shepherd this through it's such a critical issue to really understand um, what's going on, what impacts water systems and, you know, end users and customers are seeing um, throughout the state now as it relates to their water costs. And so, um, you know, happy to be here, be part of the team. It is an aggressive schedule to get these results. Um, even 500, 600 is going to be a, a big lift. You know, we did one survey er earlier this year and, and didn't get uh, that much of a response. And so it really is going to be an all hands on deck. And that means um, water systems, we need your help uh, participating in this, associations, uh, NGOs, and, and water board staff. It's all of us working together that's going to get the response that we really need to best assess uh, the situation that we're all uh, facing with right now. So I'm looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and working on this and hope you are too. And so uh, let's uh, see what we can get together here in the next couple months. Thank you. Fantastic. Really appreciate both of you and your leadership in all this. And uh, again, Max and uh, Director Sobek as well uh, for making this a priority and putting the resources. And I want to acknowledge Darren Pohamus as well, uh, who you know, his leadership at the Division of Drinking Water is, is really critical here and just really thankful for everyone. So, uh, well, good. Thank you. Uh, any, any other comments or questions from uh, fellow board members? Uh, I know this is on the particular follow-up around this question of household debt accruing because of the moratorium in place on shutoffs and impacts the systems. But uh, there are obviously other aspects to our COVID response here that we're not necessarily covering, but are ongoing, uh, including you know, the transition to these digital platforms and continuing to make the board's work and process more available to more individuals to come to speak, to engage on, in the compli uh, complicated and complex discussion, discussions that uh, decisions as well that the board is called to make. Well, one thing I, yeah, sorry, so, just to, yeah. um, one thing I forgot to mention is um, I know the notice I think just went out or is going out today for um, October 30th joint uh, workshop yeah. with the CPUC. And I know many of our board members and, you know, welcome all board members um, to join for that. Um, but I know with the, um, with the commission, 
in looking at COVID-19 um, affordability impacts. And so look forward to, to that joint effort um, in along in the same topic area and looking across our um, with our sister agencies and boards to, to figure out how we are able to respond and craft an effective response. That notice did go out uh, last night, board member Firestone, and we will be circulating it to all of our stakeholder lists today. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate the flag board member. It is gonna be a, a really great discussion. Uh, we, I, for those of you that may not necessarily be aware, we share uh, some of the regulatory space here with water systems with the, the Public Utilities Commission. They have oversight over the private, uh, in part we share uh, obviously on regulations and such, but they have, a uh, greater oversight of private water systems where the water boards uh, is oversees public water systems. And so the joint, um, the joint uh, session will be very welcome. Uh, and so appreciate everyone's leadership on that as well. Thank you. Well, uh, with that, I think we can uh, go back quickly to public comment and I apologize. And uh, we'll invite up uh, Mr. Vargas uh, here to uh, provide the public comment uh, that he was not able to uh, prior. And so thanks for, for holding off there for a moment and glad you could uh, join us back uh, here, Mr. Vargas. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the opportunity to let me give you my uh, input. I just uh, just want to reiterate what everybody, along with Johnny, Kelly, and everybody had mentioned. Um, I just want to give you guys from a perspective from a Latino growing up in Kern County. I was born here in Kern County, I've lived here all my life for 31 years. I actually grew up in a very small town called Los Hills. I don't know if you guys know where that's at. It's a very small, um, uh, low income Hispanic community. So for me growing up, going to Bakersfield, it, it, it's like going you know, to, when we would go to the Kern River, it's, it's like going to the beach. For us uh, low income people that don't have the opportunity to go to the actual beach because of our transportation, when we would go, it was an opportunity for us to go basically to the lake, to the beach, to enjoy it. And uh, that's one of the things that I always enjoyed about Bakersfield is that the water makes it, it gives you a positivity, uh, gives you a good environment to feel proud about your city. Same thing where um, most people kind of put Bakersfield down because why, you know, who, what is that place? Why, why do you choose to live in, in that place when it's super hot in the summer and it's uncomfortable, what is there to do? And for me, it's not what is there to do, it's what you make out of it. So one of the things that's why I've enjoyed and I wanna to continue to stay here in Kern County, I'm very passionate about my community and that's why I ask the board in support uh, for the Kern River water to be restored back. And I thank you guys very much for your time and for allowing me to give my feedback. And I hope that, uh, that it, it does come back very soon. Thank you so much, Mr. Vargas. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today to give to give us comment and to give us perspective of life and Bakersfield and the needs of the community. So I uh, really appreciate your advocacy and, and look forward to continue to hear uh, uh, your, your perspectives around all this. So I appreciate it, Mr. Vargas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, being able to, again, touch back over to public comment. Mr. Vargas wasn't able to provide and uh, that brings us to item number three. Uh, the, I, the issue with item number three is that uh, we have actually um, uh, the Delta lead scientist uh, giving us their update from Finland. And so she is not gonna be able to join us until 10 o'clock. We have about 10 minutes till that moment. And so I think what we can do now um, is maybe just take a break and then we'll come back and then uh, resume on item number three. Does that sound good, Mr. Laffer? Anything I'm missing there? Well, Chair Escobar, what I was going to propose is just as a matter of house cleaning is to go ahead and take the consent calendar uh, before your break. Uh, we have no speaker cards on items four or five. Okay, no, that's a good, that, thank you. That's a better suggestion there. And yeah, let's go ahead and take up the uncontested items uh, four and five then uh, prior to, to taking a break so that we can simply come back and start on number six. I'll move adoption of items four and five. Great, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Townsend, can you please call a roll call vote? Yes. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Board Member Firestone. Aye. Board Member McGuire. 
Aye. Board Member Dodek? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. The uh, vote carries and the two uncontested items, number four and five are adopted. And just wanna thank all the good work I know that went into that uh, from staff and folks uh, and appreciate that um, we could quickly get them adopted here. So thank you. Okay, and with that, I think uh, best to, to then go ahead and take a break until item number three, uh, which we will convene at 10 o'clock for, or return here at 10 o'clock for. So see you all in a few minutes. Thank you.
All right, it's 10 o'clock. I think we can start bringing ourselves back here. Actually, 10.01. Hello, everyone. We're back now, and we are moving on to item number six. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Where am I? Um, item number three, um, Going, jumping back up. Apologies. And this is a quarterly Delta Stewardship Council lead scientist report uh, and update. And so I'll kick it over to Mr. Michael George, our Delta Water Master, to introduce the item. And good to see you again, uh, Ms. Larson. Nice to see you as well. Good morning, uh, Chair Raskaval and members of the board. I'm Michael George, the Delta Water Master. And as you know, my position reports jointly to the State Water Board and to the Delta Stewardship Council, which is why I'm the internal sponsor for the quarterly uh, lead scientist report. Um, as you'll hear in a moment from Dr. Larson, uh, there's a great deal of activity going on uh, particularly in the shared Delta science enterprise. And I also want to say that there has been a lot of activity going on uh, really connecting the water board and the stewardship council in these uh, uh, scientific basis reports and research and so forth. And I'm pleased to see that we are getting additional uh, cooperation, cross fertilization between our two organizations. This morning um, is the uh, first quarterly lead scientist report by the new Delta lead scientist, Dr. Laurel Larson, who joined us now from uh, her sabbatical and research uh, uh, perch in Finland. Dr. Larson, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Chair Esquivel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before all of you here today, and I'm looking forward to starting a conversation that's going to carry us through the next three years. Um, can I get the slides, please? Thank you. So I have a lot of ground that I'm going to cover today, and I'm going to jump right in. Next slide, please. Just to give you an outline with where I'm going over these 30 minutes, I'm going to start out by providing you with some introductions to new people in the Delta Science program. Um, Michael George also asked that I provide a few slides of my own research so that you could get to know me a little better as well. Uh, and then I'll move into a discussion of some of the current and upcoming activities of the Delta Science program, both in terms of workshops and other activities. And then finally, I will do three quick spotlights of articles that have recently come out highlighting important aspects of Delta science with some connection to the Delta science program. And I, I picked these because I thought they would also be of interest to the water boards. So next slide, please. I'll start out by telling you a little bit about my own research. Um, one of the main themes of my research that's particularly relevant to my current position is flow and transport processes in aquatic ecosystem restoration. And I've done extensive work both in Southern Louisiana where the focus has been on understanding the processes involving flow, vegetation dynamics and sediment that contribute to accretion and re reversal of subsidence at the coastal margin. And then I've been involved in work in the Everglades that has sought um, to really pinpoint target flow velocities that should be reintroduced into the landscape in order to maintain habitat for fish and wildlife. And I'll get a little bit more into detail um, on the Everglades research. Next slide. So my Everglades work falls under the umbrella of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, which has the motto, getting the water right. I like this slide because you could just replace the state with California and see something very similar for the Delta. Uh, historically in the Everglades, flows were characterized by broad, slow sheet flow from Lake Okeechobee down through the Southern part of the peninsula. Uh, but over the past century, those flows were both highly diminished uh, through drainage of the Everglades and shunting of water from Lake Okeechobee out into the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico um, and those flows were also quite compartmentalized through the construction of levees. So now we have a highly disconnected system. And one of the proposals uh, for Everglades restoration is to remove some of those barriers to flow and reinstate natural flow releases 
to restore some of the uh, more natural flow patterns while maintaining water supply for the urban east coast of Florida and for the agricultural region around Lake Okeechobee. Next slide. A lot of my early work, this is work dating back to my dissertation, was focused on trying to understand how flow maintains habitat diversity through the Everglades. And you can get a sense for that habitat diversity on the left-hand photograph, which depicts an intact ridge and slough landscape. Here, the gray features are more open water environments that convey most of the flow through the system. And the connectivity of these sloughs in the direction, uh, in, in the dominant flow direction is thought to be essential for uh, maintaining healthy fish populations. I constructed a numerical model that evaluated the coupled dynamics of flow and sediment transport, vegetation processes, and peat accretion, um, and, and then used that model to really play around with settings. What happens if we decrease flow beneath a certain level? What happens if sediment processes change or vegetation uh, species compositions change. And one of the main messages to come out of that modeling is that if flow is not sufficient to redistribute sediment through the landscape, namely from the sloughs to the ridges, you develop a highly degraded landscape pattern in which the sloughs are no longer connected. Um, so in the plots that you see on the right-hand side of this, of, of this figure, um, the dark, uh, the, the black, uh, portions of the plot represent ridges and the gray portions represent the sloughs. So we see a disconnectivity of, of the sloughs on, in the no flow case, or even in a case where you have flow, but that, where that flow is not sufficient to transport sediment. It's only when you have flow that is sufficient to transport sediment that you develop a stable ridge and slough landscape in which the sloughs remain connected over long periods of time. Next slide. So one of the really fun things about this, uh, please go again, I, I didn't realize there was an animation. Um, one, one of the really fun things about this research is that it played a, a role in informing a, an adaptive management project in which uh, various agencies, including the US Geological Survey, uh, the South Florida Water Management District, and then several university partners evaluated whether pulsed flow releases through the system uh, could indeed redistribute sediment and maintain intact uh, or extant habitat structure. Uh, so it was decided fairly early on in the Everglades restoration that it is not feasible to simply remove barriers to flow, the levees and canals that you see crisscrossing the state on the left-hand side. Um, and this is because that uh, flows into the Everglades, into the watershed have been sufficiently diminished that if you were just to remove the barriers to flow, water levels uh, would be fairly low, much lower than they were historically and would not support uh, the habitat structure that we desire. And so an alternative to removal of barriers is to actually build up head behind the barrier and then have pulse flow releases at particular times of year uh, that are designed to redistribute sediment. One of the things though that needed to be evaluated is what, what the trade-off is between the beneficial redistribution of sediment across the landscape and the possible, possible detrimental impacts of um, dispersing phosphorus, which is a limiting nutrient in the system, further into the Everglades. And so this was a trade-off that we were able to evaluate during um, a multi-kilometer scale pulse flow release experiment called the decompartmentalization physical model or DPM. Uh, we designed this experiment as a before after control impact experiment in which we monitored um, sites that were both inside and outside of the footprint of the flow releases and established a baseline before evaluating impacts. Next slide, please. And if you can, please click on the, the video as well. If you mouse over, yeah, you should get the link. So one of the things that we found over several years of pulsed flow releases is that these flow pulses were sufficient to uh, clear sloughs uh, by redistributing sediment. Um, and in fact, what you see is that the calcareous periphyton that once uh, occupied the, the surfaces of the sloughs 
uh, was moved both down towards the bed and over onto the ridge. So the sluice became much clearer. Um, our findings did document sediment redistribution from sloughs to ridges. And all of these processes are the essential processes that we think are necessary to maintain uh, slough connectivity over the long term. However, uh, we did do some statistical modeling looking at the functional connectivity with respect to different biogeochemical elements, including phosphorus. And, and the objective of this work, which I don't have time to get into the details of, was really to look at how the spatial connectivity of uh, ecosystem processes associated with certain nutrients and biogeochemical elements changed from the pre-flow to post-flow condition. And this modeling did suggest that the effects of phosphorus enrichment penetrated deeper into the study area, um, mainly by affecting the paraphyton community, shifting it from a calcareous uh, species that precipitates calcium carbonate uh, more to green algae species. Next slide. So that's a, a very quick introduction to my research, but as I said, I do have a lot of ground to cover today and I'm happy to chat with any of you more in the future about it or in the Q&A session. I'm gonna move on to introducing you to some other members of the Delta Science Program, starting with the Independent Science Board. I think many of you are probably aware that we've just gone through a pretty big turnover within the Independent Science Board with six members uh, having departed after, um, af after they became term limited. Uh, we brought on six new members that you could see here and, and you could, uh, I encourage you to go to the Delta Council website to read more about their bios. Um, but one of the things that we're really excited about with the new independent science board is that we have um, deep and broad social science expertise now, primarily in Lisa Wanger, Tanya, Heikela and uh, Virginia Dale from the University of Tennessee. Next slide, please. I'd also like to introduce you to two new members of the Delta Science Program. Uh, Chelsea Batavia is an environmental scientist who comes to us from Oregon State University after just completed, just having completed her PhD in forest ecosystems and society. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary researcher who has concentrated on the human dimensions of natural resource management. Uh, she's in the science-based adaptive management unit under Karen Kafetz. And I, I think probably several of you have interacted with her already as she has facilitated some of our recent workshops. Uh, then there's Ted Flynn, who's a senior environmental scientist under Henry DeBay in the collaborative science and peer review unit of the Delta Science Program. Ted holds a PhD in geomicrobiology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he comes to the Delta Science Program most recently from the Department of Water Resources, uh, where he served as a lead scientist for the Environmental Monitoring Program. So he's likely someone that many of you will encounter in the near future. Next slide. So I'm going to move into a discussion of recent and ongoing Delta Science Program activities next. Uh, we've had a very busy quarter in terms of the number of workshops that we've held and we're gearing up for um, more workshops in the future. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is the Sacramento River Drainage Spring Run Chinook Salmon Workshop, which took place on September 8th through 10th. Uh, the goal of this workshop was to assess the state of the science needed to generate Spring Run Chinook Salmon population estimates and identify knowledge and monitoring gaps uh, these population estimates are required as a part of the Department of Water Resources new incidental take permit uh, issued by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for the state water project. Uh, the workshop was successful in highlighting key uncertainties and knowledge gaps that will be necessary to address in order to develop a robust juvenile production estimate. Uh, identification of these gaps will in turn inform updates to the monitoring program for spring run salmon. The end goal is for DWR to implement and use a juvenile production estimate for state water project management five years from now. Um, one of the uh, outcomes of this workshop or, or one, of the, um, one of the neat things about this workshop is that it provides a model for future workshops that we're going to organize within the Delta Science Program, such as the Steelhead science and monitoring workshop, which is planned for February in 2021. 
uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation has requested that workshop in order to help them comply with mandates under the biological opinion for the Central Valley Project. Uh, just after that, the, the following week, the Greenhouse Gas and Sediment Science Workshop took place. Uh, and this is a workshop that brought together scientists and managers working on issues related to greenhouse gas monitoring using flux towers, for example, and sediment and marsh accretion in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. These two topics are related and have high potential to inform each other, but the relevant researchers and managers have not yet had a space dedicated to discussing their projects. Uh, these topics ha both have major implications for understanding the role of wetlands and other ecosystems in mitigating and responding to climate change, which has implications for the Delta Stewardship Council's climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation strategy, uh, more colloquially known as Delta ADAPTS. And then further science being generated on this topic is essential for informing and further developing the Delta plan performance measure for subsidence reversal. Uh, so we're really excited about that workshop and we'll have a report out soon. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is the Science Action Agenda Management Questions Workshop, which took place on September 29th. Um, and this, the, the Science Action Agenda itself is a part of the three-pronged Delta Science Strategy, which consists not just of the Science Action Agenda, but also the State of Bay Delta Science and the Delta Science Plan. The Science Action Agenda itself is a four-year science agenda for the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta that prioritizes and aligns science actions to inform management decisions. It also identifies major gaps in knowledge, promotes collaborative science, and builds science infrastructure. It is due for an update. Uh, we're currently working on um, developing the 2022 to 2026 Science Action Agenda. And for this reason, um, staff within the Delta Science Program has over the past few months uh, gathered uh, questions from, uh, from collaborative science and management venues and collected answers to surveys to identify priority areas for management in the next four, four years. Uh, so they initially gathered over 1,200 management questions and then prior to the workshop they were able to synthesize those down to um, 1,100 management questions. And within the workshop, more than 90 attendees discussed, revised, and or merged those 1,100 management questions. Um, so this process of identifying management questions is new uh, with this new incarnation of the science action agenda. But like the last science action agenda, the 2022 to 2026 science action agenda, uh, will be organized by management needs and will identify the major science actions needed in order for the science enterprise to be responsive to those needs. Um, right now, the Delta Science Program is in the process of compiling the feedback from each breakout session, and we look forward to the next steps of producing a manageable shortlist of top Delta management questions by later this fall and advancing the 2022 to 2026 science action agenda process. So in, in late October or early November, we will circulate a much shorter online survey to get additional input on the top management questions that emerge from the workshop before finalizing and posting the list. Uh, I think several of you participated in this workshop, uh, but if any of you have questions or comments regarding the Science Action Agenda workshop, the next steps or the overall science action agenda update process, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and you could use the email address that's posted here. And then finally, the, the last workshop uh, that we held in this quarter that we're very excited about is the science needs assessment workshop, which just took place earlier this month on October uh, 5th through 6th. Uh, the, uh, Science Needs Assessment Workshop has its origins in a memo that the Independent Science Board sent to DPIC urging the need for long-term planning beyond the four-year horizon. Um, and in particular, they were urging us to consider long-term effects of climate change and how the science enterprise is going to respond to rapidly changing conditions within the Delta. Uh, 
This um, is complementary to the 2019 Delta Science Plan's call for anticipatory science that considers long-term climate change effects as well. So originally the science um, needs assessment workshop was scheduled for late April, uh, but unfortunately when the pandemic struck in March, uh, the workshop was rescheduled uh, to just recently. And in the interim, uh, four uh, short workshops were held to prepare for the main workshop in October. In parallel, the Independent Science Board prepared a report called Preparing for a Fast Forward Future in the Delta, uh, which is seen as a bit of a guiding document for the science needs assessment workshop. So on October 5th through 6th, the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee and the Delta Independent Science Board hosted the two-day virtual workshop, which focused on identifying these long-term science needs. The workshop considered physical, chemical, biological, and human processes, as well as the infrastructure needed to integrate and support efforts to develop a bold strategy that maps out forward-looking science across the Delta Science Enterprise. Uh, funding that science was another key consideration within this workshop. Uh, we are currently in the process of preparing a report synthesizing the outcomes of that workshop, and we anticipate that the report will be available towards the end of the year, and we very much look forward to sharing that. Next slide, please. So we do have a, several upcoming workshops and meetings that I would like to highlight so that you could put, put these on your calendar if you're interested. The, the first is the Zoak Plankton Ecology Symposium, which is just around the corner on October 27th to 28th next week. Uh, this will be a virtual symposium that features the latest research on zooplankton ecology and monitoring. It will span two consecutive half days and involve talks and panel discussions that focus on the San Francisco estuary, as well as work from other systems. Uh, the primary audience for this workshop is scientists and the workshop will include contact, excuse me, content on zooplankton biology and ecology current monitoring programs, emerging methods for data collection, and the IEP's integrated zooplankton data set. There will also be a, a panel discussion on data synthesis. The Delta Science Program is organizing the symposium in collaboration with the IEP and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as the California Department of Water Resources. So the, the next um, meeting that I would like to highlight is the Adaptive Management Forum. And actually the, the, the date uh, should be corrected. It's not going to be held in January. It's going to be held February 3rd through 5th in 2021. Uh, this will be the second biennial, biennial Adaptive Management Forum. Regular Adaptive Management Forums are called for in the Delta Science Plan and by the Delta Independent Science Board in order to promote coordination and learning and foster dis discussions about implementing adaptive management within the Delta. The goals of this 2021 forum are first of all, to synthesize lessons learned from prior ecosystem restoration and water management projects and research efforts. Secondly, to foster information sharing about adaptive management. Third, to strengthen science management interactions by connecting decision makers, practitioners, stakeholders and scientists, and fourth, to stimulate dialogue around a shared vision of adaptive management. Um, the, some, the forum is organized by the Delta Science Program with the support of a planning committee of volunteers from a variety of agencies and organizations. So finally, the, the, the last thing I would like to put on your radar is the upcoming Bay Delta Science Conference, which is scheduled for April 6th through 9th uh, it will be a completely virtual meeting. And one of the advantages of that is that registration is completely free. So sign yourself up and invite all your, of your, all of your friends as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The Bay Delta Science Conference <coughs> is a forum that's held biennially. And <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting over a sinus infection. And the forum is designed for the presentation of technical analyses and results relevant to the Delta Science Program's mission to provide the best possible unbiased science-based information for water and environmental decision-making in the Bay Delta system. <clears throat> uh, 
This year, the Bay Delta Science Conference will be held jointly with the Interagency Ecological Program Workshop, which will take the form of a dedicated track within the Bay Delta Science Conference. The conference chairs this year are Stacy Sherman from CDFW and Richard Conan from UC Davis. The conference theme this year is building resilience through diversity in science. As the Bay Delta community works towards a goal of one Delta, one science by building resilience in our ecosystem, our institutions and our collective science enterprise, promoting, promoting diversity in its many facets plays a central role. This year's theme recognizes that charting pathways to get there or, or that, <clears throat> that true integration of scientific and human diversity in the Bay Delta is a work in, in progress, but that charting pathways to get there is essential uh, for building a more resilient water supply. So in this light, we are inviting talks and sessions that provide insight into the diversity of our natural system. This involves species diversity, genetic diversity, habitat diversity, and so on. Um, and also presentations that represent a diversity of perspectives and that explore ways to divert or to uh, recruit a more diverse scientific community. I'd like to point out that the abstract deadline is around the corner next month, November 23rd. And this is also the deadline for submitting proposals for oral or poster topical sessions. So I encourage you to consider um, submitting abstracts and or proposals for topical sessions. Uh, the, con the conference website is hosted on the Delta Stewardship Council's website, and Maven's Notebook also recently published the call for abstracts. So you should be able to find uh, the portal for submitting abstracts through either one of those venues. Next slide, please. There are some other notable program activities that I would like to highlight. Uh, this meeting is very timely because just yesterday we, re we released the draft uh, Delta Science Proposal Solicitation Notice, which is now available for public comment until November 2nd. Uh, this proposal solicitation package is being issued in coordination with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and we anticipate making nine, uh, up to $9 million of funds available, uh, with up to $3.5 million coming from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. The uh, proposals this year can be submitted to uh, two tracks, uh, but each proposal must contribute towards one or more action areas identified in the 2017 to 2021 science action agenda. So the two categories are standard research awards, uh, which may be disciplinary or focused on a particular topic. The maximum award is expected to be $700,000 per proposal. Uh, these proposals are for projects lasting 12 to 31 months in duration, and we expect to issue five to six awards. The new category this year is Integrated Socio-Ecological Systems Awards, uh, which are designed to be larger in scope than the standard research awards, uh, may involve a larger number of co-investigators, and should meaningfully integrate at least one social science discipline with that, at least one biophysical science discipline to address cross-disciplinary research needs identified in the science action agenda. <clears throat> the awards uh, within this category are also expected to be larger, up to $1.5 million per proposal. And again, these projects are for uh, durations of 12 to 31 months. We expect to make two to three awards in this category. Uh, I won't go through the, all of the details of the timeline here, but I just want to mention a few really important upcoming dates. Uh, one new feature of this proposal solicitation notice is that we're, we are requiring interested parties to submit a letter of intent by December 15th. Uh, this will enable us to put together a review panel with the needed expertise. And then the other deadline that I'd like to point out today is the February 12th deadline, uh, which is the deadline for proposal submission. Next slide, please. Another important thing that we have on our agenda is an update to the State of Bay Delta Science document, um, which is part of our three-pronged Delta Science strategy. Uh, there have been two other State of Bay Delta Science documents issued. The first uh, back in 2008 uh, under the CalFED program, and this, this really established the baseline for the state of scientific knowledge about the system and it provided some reframing of the interaction between science and policy that guided the next uh, 
the next eight years within the Delta. The last edition was the 2016 edition, uh, which consisted of 15 peer reviewed papers. It was comprehensive in scope and these papers collectively identified and addressed the most relevant science issues based on a survey of senior scientists and managers working in the Delta. We're changing the way that we're approaching the state of Bay Delta science document, uh, starting with the 2022 update. Uh, for the foreseeable future, we anticipate uh, releasing updates to state of Bay Delta science about every two years, uh, but they will be smaller in scale. So more on the order of five peer reviewed papers rather than 15 peer reviewed papers. Uh, and they will be topically focused. So we anticipate that the theme for 2022 is going to be ecosystem services and disservices of primary producers, plants and algae within the Delta. And the proposed chapters that will comprise this uh, version of the state of Bay Delta science will include an overview of invasive aquatic species and their origins, uh, one of the new chapters that we just recently added to this uh, perspective uh, plan is um, a chapter that focuses on strategies for managing invasive species. Uh, there will be another chapter focused on emerging methods, primarily remote sensing for studying primary producers. Uh, one chapter will be focused on cyanobacteria and harmful algal blooms. And the final one will be focused on carbon sequestration and subsidence reversal. Uh, we're currently in the process of identifying lead authors for the chapters uh, and uh, will be in touch with those potential leads in the near future. Next slide, please. Then an another program activity that I think is of particular interest to the water boards is the Delta Science Tracker. Uh, the Delta Science Plan calls for a standardized, transparent, and interoperable method for collecting, summarizing, and sharing information about science activities as a way of supporting collaboration and addressing some of the challenges that lie ahead. Uh, a tracking system for Delta Science funding was also identified by DPIC Science Funding Initiative in 2019. Uh, so following that, a Delta Science Tracker advisory team was assembled and they have been working to envision uh, or, or to develop a vision for what this science tracker is. So the science tracker is seen as a common inventory to document science activities, uh, also to track information about past and ongoing science activities, including a transparent view of funding streams. And we anticipate that it will be used to identify opportunities to improve collaboration among the Delta science community and also to help researchers uh, locate uh, projects and data that might be relevant to their own work. Um, we have been uh, working with ESSA Technologies in order to scope the functionality of this document. Uh, the project uh, initially kicked off in May of 2020, but the group has uh, been meeting fairly frequently over the last quarter and has been making great progress in uh, envisioning what this Delta Science Tracker is going to be. Uh, they've held a series of workshops in October uh, for the interagency Delta Science Tracker advisory team. Um, and there will be opportunities to provide comments and suggestions on the Delta Science Tracker as we get closer to the prototype system. And then during the soft launch in the latter half of 2021. Uh, in the meantime, if you have comments or inquiries, I'm, I'm happy to pass those on to members of the Delta Science Tracker advisory team. Next slide. Then I would like to uh, point out that one member of our staff, Sam Beshevkin, um, has just released a Delta smelt conditions report, which spans data collected from 2002 to the present. Uh, the intent of the report is to provide an annual summary of Delta smelt habitat conditions, as well as uh, Delta smelt populations using automated workflows as much as data accessibility will allow. Uh, this is one of the elements of the Delta smelt science plan developed by CAMPT and adopted by CSAMT. Uh, and I, I am just, uh, in this slide, I have pulled out a few of the time series that are available in this report as representatives of three types of time series. Um, 
first our Delta Smelt Abundance Time Series uh, through several different monitoring programs. Uh, a number of biotic drivers are also included in this report and a number of abiotic drivers are included. Uh, so this could be a um, potentially very useful resource and synthesis document uh, for many in our scientific community. Next slide. I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to just do very brief spotlights of a few articles. Um, I don't think I'll get into the third article that I initially intended to, to do, uh, but the first article that I'd like to spotlight is a paper that was uh, that, that John Durand from the Center of Watershed Studies at Davis usually uh, recently came out with. Um, and this paper is a synthesis and lessons learned from uh, the 2012 to 2016 drought. Um, the, the report was based on, or the review was based on available reports and data gathered, uh, excuse me, guided by discussions with 27 agency staff, stakeholders and researchers, and also a, a series of long-term data sets. Um, I am highlighting the recommendations that came out of the report here. I'm not gonna read through all of them. I just wanna highlight a few. Uh, one is that the authors identified that one of the biggest success stories of 20, the 2012 to 2016 drought uh, was the use of a salinity barrier um, established on the, the False River. Uh, according to the authors, this project was one of the best examples of science-informed adaptive management. Scientists were able to mobilize to conduct baseline surveys of salinity, water quality in general, food web dynamics, and invasive clam distribution prior to installation of the barrier. And then having that baseline enabled them to actually attribute changes in salinity and species abundance and ecological processes directly to installation of the dam in a statistically robust manner. And their study showed that the barrier was quite effective at mitigating salinity and detrimental ecological change. Now, the, the plot that I put up here is a plot of winter run Chinook salmon abundance over uh, the past few decades. And one of the things that this shows is that, first of all, during drought conditions, uh, winter run, uh, and particularly after drought conditions, winter run Chinook salmon uh, popu populations plummet, but it also shows that hatchery operations can be utilized uh, to minimize adverse effects to the populations. However, there is a trade-off in the sense that uh, the percentage of, uh, uh, of fish with their origins in the hatcheries uh, increased dramatically uh, in, during and in the aftermath of the drought. And so uh, they recommend that more research on trade-offs in, ha in hatchery operations be conducted. Next slide. And I think I'll end my presentation with this quick spotlight, um, but I, I definitely would like to spotlight this recent paper. This is actually, it's in press right now. Um, the lead author is Brian Mahardia, uh, uh, Steve Culberson from the Interagency Ecological Program and Louise Conrad, Conrad from the Delta Science Program are both co-authors on this paper. Uh, but this is another drought paper looking at the resistance and resilience of pelagic and littoral fishes and also native and non-native fishes to drought in the San Francisco estuary uh, using several long-term monitoring data sets. Uh, the paper uh, was looking at resistance as a measure of the decline of species occurrence from a wet to a subsequent drought period or actually the lack of, of decline of species occurrence from a wet to a subsequent so subsequent drought period um, and, and resilience was quantified as the increase in species occurrence from a drought to a subsequent wet period. Um, these coefficients are derived through Bayesian modeling. Uh, the pelagic fish data were obtained from two different data sources, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's fall midwater trawl monitoring program, which extends back to 1967. And the littoral fish data were obtained from the US Fish and Wildlife Service's Delta Juvenile Fish Monitoring Program, which involves weekly, uh, weekly to bi-weekly beach seining from 1976 on. 
the, the sampling was not implemented consistently until 1995. Um, and so the authors really look at three droughts from the 1995 period to the present. Uh, there's a lot of complexities to these results, but there were several consistent messages that emerged. One is that pelagic fishes uh, consistently declined during droughts, uh, with, meaning that they exhibited negative resistance coefficients. But they did exhibit a considerable amount of resiliency and often rebound in the subsequent wet years, um, meaning that they show positive resilience coefficients on the right-hand side of this plot. I should note here that the filled-in circles indicate coefficients uh, that are significant for which the date for which the confidence interval does not include zero. However, with the pelagic fishes, they saw that full recovery does not occur in all wet years following droughts, leading to permanently lower baseline numbers for some pelagic fishes over time. And again, this stresses the message that hatchery operations can really um, aid in the resiliency of these populations. Um, uh, and another point is that native species uh, were among the least resistant to the 2012 to 2016 drought, uh, perhaps because this drought was outstanding in that it um, was characterized not by excessively low rainfall, but by excessively high temperatures. Um, historically, though, native species were more resilient to drought, though we didn't see this in the 2012 to 2016 drought. Uh, so keep an eye out for this paper. It's actually available online now from the Ecological Applications website. Um, but this is an important uh, synthesis paper uh, for several decades of fish monitoring data. So I know I'm, I'm running over time. I'd like to end this presentation here uh, and open the floor up to any questions if there's time now, or I'm happy to uh, correspond with people offline as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Larson. You know, I'm, I just feel incredibly fortunate for the Delta Stewardship Council for your role. You, the change of pace, the, the intensity of the work around the science of the Delta, our management of it is incredible. And so be, to be able to have an agency like the Delta Stewardship Council leadership, like uh, from Chair Tatayan and others, uh, is, 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 is well needed and just want to thank you first and foremost. You know, I, I, I just would, uh, for my own interest, really in, uh, interested in the, uh, the, the Delta Science Tracker. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, um, the, there's a robust effort around access to open data around water to help facilitate decision making. And that whole science enterprise is a huge part of that. Continuing to adopt open source standards, continuing to open up that whole academic discussion to these sorts of platforms uh, are really important, I think, if we're going to better coordinate what is an incredible amount of work being done, both on the NGO, the community, uh, you know, the, the academic side, from our, our water users to, uh, you know, the whole, the whole uh, as you know, community of stakeholders that it takes to, to actually um, start to see some change and to reconcile what we've inherited in the Delta and these water systems. And I think that is particularly for me, what is so critical around the work at the Delta Strategy Council and the Science Enterprise is that it helps us understand and reconcile this system. And it's difficult. Um, it is not, uh, the, you look at the trends and the declines and to your part point, it's good to see that the science shows some resiliency within the species, but with each subsequent drought, we continue to reduce that baseline and we continue to see just the wholesale shift of the ecology of the Delta beneath us and um, are, are running out of time to, to really start to actually put resources to and manage the Delta in a way that makes most sense. And even there, the example of the salinity barrier, uh, uh, a really good one where, again, um, it, there's trade-offs in these management decisions. Having a science enterprise there that does the monitoring ensures that we we actually pull lessons from those management activities that can translate to better management decisions later down the line are so critical. So just thank you, uh, just uh, really appreciative and look forward to hearing more about the science tracker and ways that we continue to build you know, consensus and uh, around mm -hmm. uh, the work that we need to be doing. And I'll, I'll open yes, up to my other fellow board members, but uh, thank you. Well, thank you for those comments. They resonate with me quite strongly. Um, and I will say that in, in the extent to which I've been involved with the Delta Science Tracker advisory team, 
Um, I have brought up efforts within the water boards uh, to make data more open, transparent, easily accessible. And I, I see that effort as being highly complementary to what we're trying to develop with the science tracker. And I look forward to engaging the water boards uh, further uh, with that ongoing effort. Thank you, Dr. Vice Chair. Yeah, I'll just jump in and uh, really thank you for the comprehensive report. I took a lot of notes and couldn't really keep up. Um, on the last report, um, I started to write down the authors, but the, the name of the report on the, um, the the last report, do you have the name of that? Yes, um, it is uh, Resistance and Resilience of Pelagic and Littoral Fishes, the Drought in the San Francisco Estuary. And it's in press at Ecological Applications. Great, thank you. Um, I look forward to an opportunity to maybe read through it and I'm sure I'll have some follow-up questions for you. So. Um, thank you for the report and uh, just want to thank you also for um, flagging for us some of the upcoming events so that we can get them on our calendar and uh, look forward to future reports. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you at these events. Any other comments from fellow board members or questions? Well, Thank you again, Doctor, for, for taking your time today and look forward to further updates and to seeing you hopefully in person here at some point as well. Um, yes, uh, I will be back December 15th. And oh, fantastic. I'll probably see, uh, well, at least I'll be more available and on the same time zone come January 1st. <laughs> great, really great. Just again, thank you so much for the great review and uh, to Vice Chair's uh, point as well, uh, the, the dates flagging the, the many upcoming opportunities to engage in these discussions, not just for us, but uh, anyone viewing here as well. Uh, it's, it, it really is uh, incumbent upon all of us to, to participate and to continue to uh, contribute to what is uh, an incredible lift in this state when we talk about addressing the Delta, addressing these inherited challenges that we have in reconciling a really critical system. So thank you again, doctor, really appreciate the time today. And thank you again to uh, the Delta uh, Water Master, uh, Mr. Michael George. I really appreciate that, his continued work. He is our bridge between us and the Delta Stewardship Council. We share the, the Water Master and uh, are incredibly fortunate for the resources and discussion that he brings to us as well. So thank you, Mr. George. Okay, with that, uh, that concludes this item then. And again, really appreciate the thorough uh, overview of the work being done uh, currently in the Science Enterprise in the Delta. And it brings us to item number six, which is consideration of a proposed resolution to adopt the proposed Clean Water Act Section 303D list for the North Coast region and approve the proposed 303D list portion of the 2018 California Integrated Report. That is a lot. For those of you first joining us uh, on this item, it is uh, the 303D list is a list of impaired water bodies in the state. and uh, it's a really critical uh, work uh, workload and data. Uh, you know, when we talk about improving our data systems and improving our ability to do this complex regulatory work, the integrated report is an incredible uh, feat. So with that, I'll turn it over to staff to actually give us a, a better overview, but really thank you everyone's good work. I know this is for me a point of pride that we continue to be able to advance, make, make really good progress on getting uh, caught up on our integrated reports. But uh, again, it's actually in, required us to improve our data systems and the lines of evidence and all the handling uh, around this project. So I'll kick it over to Lori and thank you, Ms. Weber for, for joining us and for your leadership in a lot of that process improvement. Um, again, I've been, I've been just very impressed by it. So thank you. Thank you, I appreciate your, um words of support. Um, we, we enjoy data in this program and we love working with data and um, doing what we can to make it open and transparent. Um, much appreciated. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin my presentation. Uh, good morning again, uh, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Um, I'm Lori Weber and I'm the Senior Environmental Scientist in the Standards and Assessment section of the Division of Water Quality at the State Water Board. Um, with me today is Rebecca Fitzgerald, Chief of the Standards and Assessment Section, and as well, Stacey Gillespie, um, our attorney from the Office of Chief, Chief Counsel. 
Um, and again, we're presenting item number six, um, a bit of a mouthful, consideration of a re resolution to adopt the proposed Clean Water Act 303D list for the North Coast region and approve the proposed 303D portion of the 2018 integrated report. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an outline of the presentation today. First, I'll be giving you a brief overview of the integrated report, um, how it's structured and the process that we go through to develop it. Then I'll briefly summarize the 2018 cycle, which is the cycle we're talking about today, um, and the number of proposed listings and delisting decisions um, for that cycle. Um, then we'll um, have a segment on the North Coast 303 D list, where I'll summarize responses and comments and our recommendations um, related to the North Coast list. Um, at that point, I will be turning the presentation over to Rebecca Fitzgerald to discuss some of the recent change sheets that have been released um, related to indicator bacteria in the Russian River. Um, and then we'll have, um, we'll, we'll pause briefly for board questions and public comments specifically on the North Coast 303D list for discussion. Um, after that, segment. Um, I'll pick up the presentation again to summarize comments and responses and staff recommendations on proposed listings and delistings um, approved by regional water boards, which were um, requested for state board review. Um, and then I'll conclude my presentation and there'll be time for public comment, board discussion, um, and, you know, and board discussions prior to consideration of adoption of the resolution. Uh, next slide, please. So just as a brief overview, this slide um, illustrates how the integrated report is structured. The report consists of two parts. It's the 303D list of impaired water bodies, as you mentioned, um, and also the 305B report. Um, and as you can imagine, it's designed to meet the requirements of sections 303D and 305B of the Clean Water Act. Um, again, the 303D list is a list of waters that have um, been determined to be impaired because water quality standards have not been changed. Um, and generally, this means that um, pollutant levels or measured pollutant levels are high enough that they exceed their thresholds that are protective of beneficial uses. So, for example, an impairment could mean that in a given lake, levels in fish are too high for people or wildlife to eat them. Um, or in another example, um, bacteria levels at a public beach are high enough to indicate that people eating water have a risk of becoming sick. Um, just to uh, add on to that a bit, uh, state and federal law require that the 303D list be approved by the state water board. Um, and then once the water body is um, determined to be prepared, uh, total maximum daily load or TMDL or an alternative program um, must be developed to fix the impairment and restore the water body so that it attains uh, water quality standards. Um, and just very briefly, the, um, regarding the 305B report, um, the, the 305B report describes the overall condition of surface, surface water quality and not just impairment. Um, we include it in the integrated report, uh, but it does not require state board or US EPA approval. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the listing policy, a little bit about the listing policy. This is the state policy that guides how we develop the 303D list. And so you'll hear a lot about um, what we do, um, you know, per listing policy guidance. Um, and the purpose is to lay out a standard approach for developing the 303D list. Uh, and it, it describes, in the listing policy, it describes uh, listing and delisting factors, which are what we use to, to determine if a water body is impaired or not impaired. Um, so, for example, one of the factors is exceedances of a water quality objective. Um, the listing policy also contains requirements for how the program is implemented, um, and it was originally um, adopted in 2004 and amended in 2015. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a graphic showing how the data are organized and how we report the data in water body fact sheets. Um, the first level of organization is a line of evidence or LOE, um, it, which is where we use that we compare the data to a numeric threshold, such as a water quality objective, um, which is linked to a beneficial use. Um, 
Secondly, we combined all of the lines of evidence for the same pollutant in a water body and make a listing or delisting decision. So I'd like to point out that decisions are made for each pollutant. So we typically refer to them as water body pollutant combinations or water body pollutant decisions. And this is the level of, um, at which we make the individual 303D listing decision, um, which is why you'll hear that water body X is compared for bacteria or water body Y is compared for mercury. Um, I just want to point out that water body fact sheets report on all of the decisions within a given water body, and there may be more than one decision. So you could have a water body that's compared for both bacteria and mercury. Next slide, please. And this kind of puts the 303 D list in the context of the, um, the 305 B report. So each, each water body gets placed into what we call an integrated report condition category. Um, and these categories re represent the 305 B portion of the report. Um, the categories are numbered one to five, with one being the best and five being the worst in terms of water quality condition. Uh, category one at the very top here, these are water bodies um, that we can determine where we can determine that at least one beneficial use is being supported and that there is no evidence to indicate that other uses are impaired. Um, and we actually do have about 478 water bodies that have been identified to be in category one. Um, so there is a, a little bit of good news with this. Um, moving down, category five is for water bodies where at least one impairment exists and a TMDL is needed. So that's the most um, kind of the worst of the categories to be in if you're a water body. Um, and then just to clarify, the um, EPA considers category five to be the 3D list. Um, in California, under the listing policy, um, our list consists of um, water bodies in category 4A, 4B, and 5. Uh, next slide, please. And here's just a very high level summary of the 2018 cycle, which is um, before you today. For the 2018 cycle, there were three regions on cycle. Those are the North Coast, Lahontan, and Colorado River Basin regions. These regions assessed all readily available in the regions that were submitted prior to the data cutoff date. Um, of those three on cycle regions, the Lahontan and Colorado River regions held a hearing and adopted their listing decision. Um, with respect to the North Coast region, the State Board is administering the entire public process on behalf of the North Coast. Uh, this is why we held a hearing on the proposed listings for this region in April and why we have a separate segment um, to discuss the 303D list for the North Coast region in this presentation. Um, additionally, um, and you'll hear about this later in the presentation, Four of the other regions made selective, off, what we're calling off-cycle decisions um, based on assessments of data that they prioritize for assessment. And those include the San Francisco Bay, Los Angeles, Central Valley, and San Diego region. Um, the data cutoff date for the 2018 cycle was May 3rd of 2017. Uh, and then additionally, I would just like to mention that uh, the Clean Water Act does require that the integrated reports be submitted to the US EPA every, US EPA every two years. So we are actually working on multiple cycles concurrently so that we can start to submit them on time. The next integrated report that we will bring to you will be a, com a combined 2020-2022 integrated report. And we, it will be submitted to the EPA before the April 1st, 2022 deadline. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> and here's just some basic statistics about the 2018 cycle. Um, for this cycle, we received and assembled about 1.4 million rows of data for the three on-cycle regions, so the uh, North Coast, Lahontan, and Colorado River regions. After reviewing the data for completeness, checking it for quality, we organized them into about 30,000 different lines of evidence of, and or LOEs. And we then further grouped the LOEs into water body pollutant combinations. And we ended up about, with about 6,600 of these. So these are the individual decisions that we made. Um, and as I described in a prior slide, we, we evaluated the, LOE, the LOEs from each water body pollutant combination and made a decision on whether or not the water body is impaired for that pollutant. 
Um, I'd also want to bring up that pursuant to change sheet number one that was released on Friday, October 16, um, the total number of proposed new listings in the North Coast for this cycle has been reduced by four indicator bacteria decisions in the Russian River watershed. Um, so instead of 42 proposed new listings for the North Coast region, there are actually 38, and a total, which, which would result in a total of 173 proposed new listings statewide. Um, and we will go into more detail on the North Coast um, change sheet in, in the next in, in, uh, subsequent slides. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a chart just breaking down the proposed new listings by major pollutant category. Um, so each bar re uh, represents the number of listings in each category. And as you can see, the top three categories in regard, um, are for indicator bacteria, metals, and nutrients. The numbers um, on the bars are further broken down, or that yeah, are further broken down by regional board um, as shown by the color coding. So, for example, if you look at region six, which is the the yellow um, the yellow color, there are 35 proposed bacteria listings, 10 proposed metal, metals listings, and 25 proposed listings for nutrients and so on. Um, also, as I mentioned in a prior slide, the, the four indicator bacteria decisions are being removed from the proposed North Coast list. So the total number of proposed indicator bacteria decisions is actually 40 and not 44. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And this, show, this slide shows the proposed new D listings by pollutant category. So these are the water bodies, water body pollutant combinations that we're recommending to take off of the list. <clears throat> there are a total of 47 proposed new D listings. Um, for example, you can see region five in the Central Valley, they're proposing to, um, we're proposing to remove 28 uh, pesticide listings. Um, there are also a small number of delistings for indicator bacteria, nutrients, metals, sediment, salinity, and toxicity. Next slide, please. And this slide is just meant to give you a, a very general overview of what the entire 303 delist would look like if the proposed listings and delistings from the 2018 cycle were included. Um, so it includes listings from all of the regional water boards, and you can see that the top four categories as far as the number of listings are pesticides, indicator bacteria, metals, and nutrients. Next slide, please. Here's just a reminder of our timeline. Um, the data cutoff date, as I mentioned, was uh, May 3rd of 2017. We released the draft staff report on March 19 of this year, and um, after a public comment period and hearing on the North Coast waters, we released the revised staff report and the response to comments on September 18. And today, October 20th, we're here before you to give you an opportunity to consider adoption of the 2018-303D list. Next slide, please. Uh, for the next couple of slides, we'll give you an overview of the significant comments we received on the proposed 303D list for the North Coast. Um, and then, as I said, we'll be pausing for questions, oral comments, and discussion of the proposed North Coast 303D list. Next slide, please. So during the data solicitation period, we received trash data collected from coastal beaches and pH data collected in ocean waters um, in the, of the North Coast region. And during the public comment period, uh, commenters um, requested that these coastal waters be listed or stated that they should be listed as impaired for these pollutants based on the data submitted. In our responses, we explained that we had assembled the data and evaluated the data, but um, they did not meet the quality standards required by the listing policy. Uh, additionally, for both constituents, there um, is no appropriate evaluation guideline that meets listing policy requirements. Um, and just as a reminder for the listing policy, an evaluation guideline must be scientifically based, uh, applicable to and protective of the beneficial use, and to identify a range above which uh, impacts occur and below which no or few impacts are predicted. 
However, we would like to point out that the ocean, that ocean acidification was identified as a high priority standards project during, the, during last year's ocean plan triennial review. Um, and the water boards are actively working with the Ocean Protection Council and research institutions to develop indicators and thresholds to evaluate ocean acidification. So this research may lead to the development of thresholds that we would utilize for assessments in future integrated report cycles. Now, <clears throat> also in evaluating the trash data, um, we determined that there, there was enough evidence submitted to conclude that the um, REC2, the aesthetic enjoyment and non-contact water recreation use, um, may be potentially threatened for eight North Coast beaches. Um, that is, we're not proposing to list the beaches as impaired, but we have placed them on a watch list as potentially threatened due to trash. Uh, in addition, the Water Board is an active participant in the California Water Quality Monitoring Council trash monitoring work group. Um, and we anticipate that as trash monitoring methods are refined for statewide use, um, we will be able to incorporate uh, them into trash assessments for future integrated report cycles. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is where um, Russian River bacteria assessments, we're gonna have quite a few slides on this. Um, I'm gonna set, set the stage to let you all know that um, with the proposed final staff report, which was posted on September 18, um, that version of the staff report had recommended listing the watersheds in the Russian River as impaired for bacteria. Um, subsequent to the release of the staff report, we uh, identified issues that may result in changes to bacteria listing recommendations for several water bodies, um, as well as late comment letters that we received prompted further review of the data. So as a result, um, we're not recommending, we, we do not recommend making new listing or delisting decisions for bacteria in the Russian River watershed for the 2018 cycle. Um, and I'm, I'm now gonna turn it over to Rebecca Fitzgerald to walk you through some of the proposed changes that we're making. Well, uh, good morning, board members. This is Rebecca Fitzgerald. I'm an environmental program management manager on your staff. Can I? Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Good. Um, thank you, Lori. Thanks for setting the stage for some of the the um, recent issues that we've seen with some of the bacteria data that was presented within the Russian River um, watershed. Um, because of these, you know, late issues that um, we recognize may result in some changes to the listing recommendations, we put out a proposed change sheet last Friday. And um, actually, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and um, the change sheet would revise the proposed res resolution that's in front of you for your consideration today. Um, and what it includes is a statement that the, um, this is in one of the recitals, so one of the finding sections of the resolution, that the bacteria listing decisions, um, because of the challenges that we just identified with some, um, you know, potential issues in the underlying data, that uh, we would like those bacteria listing decisions remain as they are currently identified in the current integrated report and 303D list. So that's the 2014-2016 integrated report. And that we would then consider, that staff would consider those fresh river bacteria data in what would be the next integrated report cycle, which is the 2020-2022 integrated report. Um, the the uh, portion of the resolution includes the directive to staff would be revised to um, direct staff to make conforming changes along these lines to both the 303D list as well as the supporting documents such as the staff report. Um, so I also want to add that um, we would like to further revise this change sheet. So kind of a new revision to change sheet number one, which would have, um, instead of having direction for state water board staff and the board to later consider the Russian River bacteria data in the next, immediately next um, integrated report cycle, that instead we would consider those data in a future listing cycle. And we're recommending this additional change because the Russian River pathogen TMDL 
is likely to be considered by the state water board just around the exact same time that we are about we would be about to put out the 2020 2022 integrated report for public comment um and that's there's a potential that it might cause confusion between the two overlapping processes and we just recognize that there's some benefit in having some flexibility and when we would in when we would reassess the Russian bacteria data. Um, and just to clarify, the Russian River pathogen TMDL has been adopted by the North Coast Regional Water Board and is um, going to go, it's a basin plan amendment, so it will come to you as the state board for your consideration. And that's likely to happen again, right at the same time in late spring, early summer of next year. Um, and so therefore we um, continue to request the change to the resolution with some additional tweaks. And I'm gonna, if you would change to the next slide, please, I'll show you what that looks like in the meeting. So this is a recommended revision to recital number 10B in the finding section of the resolution so that it, you know, uh, kind of recognizes where we find ourselves of after reviewing public comments on the proposed draft 303D list for the North Coast region. Um, there were an additional concerns with the listing decisions pertaining to bacteria in the water bodies in the Russian River watershed. Therefore, the bacteria listing decisions for all of the Russian River water bodies will remain as identified in the 2014-2016 California Integrated Report in order to by that time for staff and stakeholders to review any proposed changes. And here's where our further revision is requested in a future listing cycle. And then that the state water board or the regional water board will reassess the water bodies in the Russian River watershed for bacteria in a future listing cycle. Next slide, please. Um, and then of course, there's similar changes reflected in the result. Clause, the first resolved clause um, in order to direct state water board or regional water board staff to reassess the water body in Russian River watershed for bacteria in the future of this cycle. And I hope that that is clear. I know that these are some relatively late changes. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? And this is just, I wanted to um, open up the opportunity for any questions that you may have about on any of the North Coast Region 303 delisting recommendations that we are making. Um, and also we thought this would be a good time just to focus on the North Coast. And then um, afterwards, Lori can come back and resume the staff presentation on the rest of the statewide um, proposals we're making. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Uh, I don't have any questions. I appreciate the, the consideration that was given to, I know what are, were late comments, but to the extent that there was merit and then need to um, have some adjustment here, uh, I think definitely worthwhile and uh, just appreciate the good work. Uh, any comments or questions from fellow board members on the North Coast portion of the 303D list? Yeah, I, I, I do have a quick question. And you know, this obviously making listing decisions is complicated. It involves review of lots of data. You know, it's, it's not a simple process and you know, the policies are, are challenging to follow and these decisions are not easy. And just so you know, I have maybe a better understanding, um, could you just elaborate a little bit on what those concerns were uh, with the bacteria listing on the Russian River and how that factored into this late change? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so, um, we uh, realized that there were some corrections that needed to be made in the underlying data set for bacteria. Um, we uh, were, there was an inadvertent error in the transcription of the threshold score that we use for uh, the geometric mean and the statistical threshold for the enterococci bacteria data that we assessed. And that ended up resulting in some changes in the number of geometric mean values or statistical threshold values um, that exceed the evaluation guidelines that we use for the integrated report assessment. So we had just a dip and we, we use that number of exceedances out of the total number of samples um, through a binomial distribution to really help us determine if there are enough instances where there's 
uh, you know, exceedances of our threshold to indicate an impairment. So when that number changed, it led to us then looking further at the data set. And um, if you will remember from the April hearing, we heard some comments that were concerned about the grouping of these data points um, geographically between the main stem and the tributary site. And the Ontario Coxie data set was really key to us understanding if there was a significant difference between the main stem and the tributaries. So we want to look a little bit more at what those data are telling us. Um, and we've also continued to um, look at the use of the geometric mean and the statistical threshold values um, and apply the, the um, apply the requirements, I guess that's not quite the right word, but we established in 2019, we adopted the bacteria provisions in the Inland Surface Waters and Closed Bays and Estuaries Plan. And that provided some new um, direction for how we group data into the geometric means and statistical threshold values. And this is the first time we're applying that. And again, and in looking at the data, we kind of want to double check those numbers and make sure that we are really understanding what we think is an impairment and what is not an impairment. These late changes came to us about a week and a half ago, and we are, are just recognizing that we really do need to take a very close look to make sure that the evidence of impairment exists. Uh, th thank you for that explanation. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I know I recall that there were concerns shared back in the April workshop, and I, I greatly appreciate you taking a closer look at the data, even given the late nature of the comments that were received, and just your acknowledgement that this is the first time you're applying this uh, approach. And so, you know, things happen, and I certainly understand that, but what's important is that, you know, we get this right. And so, um, you know, thank you for going through, this, through the steps and making sure that, you know, going forward here with the Russian River and, and other listing decisions as it relates to bacteria that we're um, you know, doing the analysis uh, properly and, and making a decision on um, each watershed as appropriate uh, based on the data. So thank you. And I should also mention that uh, with us today is Matt St. John, who's the executive officer for the North Coast region. And he may wish to contribute or respond to some of the um, points on, on these data as well. Well, thanks, Rebecca. If this is a, 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 an appropriate time, I'll just introduce myself. Matt, I'm Matt St. John, Executive Officer for the North Coast Region. I just want to um, say that, uh, thank State Board staff, uh, first of all, uh, for, for uh, carrying the, the public process for the uh, update to the 303D list for the North Coast Region during this cycle and specifically uh, for the uh, partnership in uh, reviewing the, the complex data set for the Russian River bacteria. Um, we support State Board uh, staff's recommendation to uh, uh, postpone the decision, take a closer look, and the North Coast Regional Board staff uh, look forward to supporting uh, State Board staff in, in that further uh, analysis. And um, as mentioned, um, the Russian River Pathogen TMDL was adopted by our the North Coast Regional Board in August of 2019 and will be coming to the State Board uh, for your consideration next spring. And so that will be a, a great opportunity for the North Coast Regional Board staff to present um, our analysis of the impairment and uh, the, the TMDL program of implementation. Um, so we look forward to that. And uh, again, thank State Board staff for this close partnership um, and look forward to working with you moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Executive Officer St. John. Really appreciate your good leadership in the region around all this. And then again, to uh, Board Member McGuire's point, uh, appreciate uh, staff's due diligence and ultimately trust and transparency around this work and these listings. It is no easy feat. You saw the number of lines of evidence that contribute to then the 6,600 individual decisions. And that's a lot to, to do in a very competent 
uh, way. And so uh, again, really uh, depend upon the good process improvements on the data side that allow us to make those sorts of decisions with confidence and the, the due diligence from staff and flagging maybe moments where uh, we just want to make sure we're getting things right. Um, so thank you for that. Other board members with any, with any questions or comments on, again, what is here, uh, the, the North Coast 303D list. Um, I'll flag for folks that we are taking, uh, the board here is taking public comment for that list and then also the full state list. We have a number of uh, uh, commenters in line here to comment just on the uh, 303D list for the North Coast component. Some that are uh, uh, commenting on that and the state list and then just state list folks. So we're gonna take a tranche here in a moment of uh, commenters that are for just the North Coast list. And if they were gonna speak on that and the state list, move on to the state uh, uh, list discussion and then take the final tranche of just state list commenters. So just wanted to make that clear for everyone. Uh, I know that um, and appreciate um, everyone's flexibility on the item. Board members, any, any further questions on the North Coast 303D list component here? Great, well, hearing none, we can move to uh, our list of commenters. First, I'd like to call up uh, Mr. Bart Diemer. Good morning, and glad I'm you can join us. Chair, oh, I'll just, just point out that uh, Mr. Diemer is part of a two-person panel, and so okay. we're asking both uh, Ms. Yardley and Mr. Diemer to go ahead and turn on their cameras at this point in time, and they have their microphones live. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Laffer. Good morning, Mr. Deemer. Good morning, Ms. Yardley. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. You have 10 minutes between you. Oh, Mr. Deemer, I apologize. It doesn't seem we can hear you. Um, you're unmuted, though, uh, so it may be uh, due to a, a mic connection on your point. Uh, on your part, if you go to the maybe the lower bottom left hand corner of your screen where the microphone is, uh, there's a small up arrow. You can choose a different microphone. Maybe um, just try a different one there quickly. See if that helps. Uh, no, still, still not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. There we Great. go. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. And uh, good morning, board members. Uh, uh, Sarah and I are going to keep this short. My name is Bart Diemer. I'm a homeowner on the Russian River in the Northwood area between Guerneville and Monterio. Our home relies on a conventional, properly maintained septic system. I'm a member of Oats Russian River Residents, a group of homeowners along the river in non-sewered communities from Fitch Mountain, upstream from Healdsburg, down to Villa Grande, downstream of Monterio. Our group has followed the Russian River TMDL and 303D listing process closely for years, and we have always favored science-based, reasonable, financially fair TMDLs for water bodies that are actually impaired. In the current round of listing, we've had many contacts with the staff since March of this year, as the staff mentioned. And you may remember that we appeared before you at your April workshop. Our ability to work with the staff in close detail has depended on the staff's willingness to share its detailed data and analysis with us, which we would like to acknowledge. In fact, our dialogue continued through last Thursday as reflected in the long detailed comment letter we submitted Friday morning before the chef staff changed its recommendation. Projects like this involve major amounts of staff effort and deciding to take a fresh start is therefore a difficult decision, but the staff was up to it. Thank you to the state staff and the region one staff for hearing us and thank you for taking a pass on listing the Russian river in the current cycle. We're encouraged that the staff has offered to meet with us as they develop a new analysis. Of course, it's critical that any 303D listing and any TMDL be grounded in current data and clear scientific analysis. And we hope that the board will direct the staff not to shy away from considering what the E. coli data 
clearly calls for delisting. There's one aspect uh, that I would like to draw to the board's attention that relates to using a continuation of the existing fecal coliform listing as a way of deferring action. The fecal coliform listing would certainly not support a TMDL because it has no scientific support as a FIB, a fecal indicator bacteria whatsoever. But a mechanical enforcement of the holdover listing could put homeowners in the currently listed stretches who have to construct a newer replacement oats into tier three under the state oats policy. Tier three requires an advanced system, raising its cost by an extra $50,000 or so, just because of the holdover listing. Since the river's E. coli readings clearly call for delisting, we favor delisting now. If the board cannot do that, we ask that it communicate to the staff its intent that homeowners not be prejudiced in the meantime by the holdover listing. Thank you. You done, Bart? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, my name is Sarah Yardley. I live in the Hacienda neighborhood of Forestville on the Russian River. I'm a retired civil environmental engineer. I'm one of nine members of the Russian River at residents on site waste treatment group and also one of nine members of the Citizens Advisory Group for Monterio Villa Grande Wastewater Solutions. And I just wanted to look at more of the big picture of the impacts of the 303 delisting. Um, the past few years have created a lot of hardship in Sonoma County. We've experienced flooding, landslides, multiple fires, and the pandemic. And we appreciate the breather that the delay or postponement of consideration of a 303 delisting will provide us. You know, working for clean water and delisting of the Russian River are not mutually exclusive. Members of the Russian River Outs Group want to work with Region 1 staff and with Sonoma County for a reasonable and funded program of solutions to septic system inadequacies. We want to work with Region 1 staff and Sonoma County for a reasonable and funded program of installing bathroom facilities or and porta potties along the river for boaters, swimmers, and homeless people. We do not want imposition of a program that lacks a sound scientific basis that we cannot defend to our community members. We do not want a top-down program of unfunded mandates that will force us and our neighbors to take on debt or sell our homes. We do want community-driven and community-shared solutions. Four members of the OUTS group are also members of the Citizens Advisory Group, or CAG, that was formed by our county supervisor to be liaison and advisory group between, on one hand, Region 1 and Sonoma County, and on the other hand, members of the communities of Montebrio and Villa Grande. The CAG meets monthly with Region 1 Sonoma Water and permits Sonoma staff to work on feasibility, governance, communications, objectives, funding, scheduling, or wastewater solution for these two communities. Region one and Permit Sonoma are working to obtain grant funding for these communities. Our shared intent is that we will find new solutions that will work for us all. And that the solutions we find for these two communities will serve as templates for other communities along the river. Community-based systems are key for OATS improvements along the river and they'll be more successful than imposition of owner's requirements on individual homeowners. We ask the state board to encourage the North Coast board and staff and Sonoma County permitting officials to push forward on these solutions and to provide the financial support that we need. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deemer and Ms. Yardley. Really appreciate your comments today. And thank you for the continued engagement with our, our staff here and look forward to continued uh, discussions as well. I know this is a, a complicated issue, uh, but one, I think that there's mutual uh, uh, just co collaboration and cooperation around. So I appreciate that. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to now then call up um, Isaac Hornenblass. Hornenblass. Apologize. Horn bless, yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Chair Escavel, if I can, uh, Mr. Hornblast, before you start, uh, just to provide clarity for the next three commenters, uh, Mr. Hornblast, you had indicated that you wished to comment on both the North Coast listing and the overall list, uh, likewise with uh, Jamie Neary and Caitlin Kalua. Uh, go ahead, and we're going to set the timer at five minutes, and you can use that time for both comments on the North Coast listing as well as the okay. statewide list. Okay, thank yeah. you. And since you'll be, and since it will be both, if you need a little extra time, uh, you can have so as well. But we'll just keep it at five for now. And if you need it, by all means. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Esquivel and board members. My name is Isaac Hornblast, and I'm a legal extern at Earth Law Center. Earth Law Center is a nonprofit organization that advocates for the right of waterways to flow. Today, we once again urge you to revise your integrated report to specifically identify flow-impaired waterways under Category 4C or 5 based on readily available data. Over 10 years ago, in the summer of 2010, a broad coalition of tribes, fishing groups, and environmental groups began asking the state to identify certain bodies as impaired due to low flows and other forms of hydro modification. Since then, against the backdrop of frequent periods of drought and worsening climate change, we have continued to ask for a small handful of hydro modification listings based on readily available data for the most flow-deprived waterways in California, some of which dry up completely due to over-diversion. Waterways impaired due to hydro modification should include the Scott River, Shasta River, Eel River, Matol River, and Mark West Creek in the North Coast region, the Mojave River, the, and Squaw Creek in the Lahontan region, and the Colorado River, which may be the most dam diverted and otherwise hydrologically impaired waterway in the entire world in the Colorado River region. As you know, in 2017, we sued on the hydro modification issue because we believe such listings are required under the Clean Water Act and state law, and that it is good public policy to list all sources of impairment in the integrated report. Ultimately, while the court agreed with us on part of our claim related to the timeliness of the integrated reports, they ruled that you do not have a duty to list for hydro modification. However, whether or not you have a duty, it is within your discretionary power to make such hydro modification listings. Our submitted comments highlight how Western states such as Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, and Washington have long been making hydro modification listings because it is good policy to address all sources of impairment. These listings can be useful tools to protect flow impaired waterways, such as by considering hydro modification listings under seeker review and section 401 permits. Relatedly, the integrated report shouldn't rely upon stale data. For example, this year's integrated report uses data only from May 3rd, 2017 and earlier for ignoring several years of appropriate and necessary data. We suggest a data submission deadline of a maximum of six months before the submission date of the report. In addition to the hydro modification issue, we have requested the state board to expand the CDEN system so it does not exclude data that fails to meet strict formatting and quality assurance requirements, such as the exclusion of all PDF submissions and the mandatory inclusion of a signed cap. Finally, although we are cognizant of staffing limitations, we do want to express again that we believe the Clean Water Act requires the inclusion of all regions in the biennial report instead of including three of California's nine water board regions at a time. In sum, we once again express our support for hydro modification listings, and even if it is just a few very clear-cut waterways at this time, that would be a step in the right direction. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much for your, your comments. Um, I know that it included the full state list uh, comments as well, and so it, this may be covered a bit in then the staff presentation that we'll be seeing, but, um, you know, just for by way of follow-up, I will be interested just to hear, I, I know when it comes to the issue of taking regions by tranches and, you know, I, I think we're moving away from that. We're looking to do a more, you know, holistic statewide snapshot, I believe, uh, but want to hear a little more uh, from staff on that. And then um, on the data submission uh, cutoff on the date, I think that's tied to just us catching up at this point to, uh, to our, 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 our lists and 
again, I think maybe some of that will be covered, but wanted just to flag and I see uh, our Chief Deputy Jonathan Bishop, Mr. Bishop. Oh, I just want to make it clear that we're not moving away from oh, the, we're not. Uh, okay. Okay. the, the three um, issues. We are, um, we are running concurrent listings that were, um, that Lori had talked okay. about earlier, but the, the fact of the matter is to do 6,000 lines of evidence takes time and we can't do it in six months. And so that we've set up the timing so that we can get uh, um, every two years based on the, um, the, the court decision to submit those that we can get them submitted every two years. But that doesn't mean that we can have up to the minute data. Um, it just takes, as you see, a lot of time to do um, all those lines of evidence. And then um, <clears throat> there are complications in every one of these. We just highlighted one with the Russian River where we had to pull back because we're moving very fast. And I'll just add to that, if I may, there's also the public process that we're very interested in making sure everybody understands and, you know, our recommendations that there's a public comment period. So between between the, the data management, data analysis and the public comment process, as much as we would love to have real time assessment of the data that's out there, it's just not something we're able to feasibly be able to do at this time. Okay, I appreciate that. And it, I think it's perhaps to comment on uh, the rolling basis of the work that um, I was I was thinking there. So thank you so much, Mr. Hornblast, for your comments. Thank you. I, I will I will flag that the hydro modification uh, inclusion in the three hundred three D list is something I'll be interested to hear more from staff about ultimately. So I and appreciate the flag that other states are using it as a, a tool already and maybe a worthwhile tool for greater consideration. But um, Part of a, a larger discussion, I'm sure. So thank you, Mr. Hornblast, again. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Jamie Neary from Russian Riverkeeper. Hello. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give oral comment today. My name is Jamie Neary, and I am the policy analyst for Russian Riverkeeper. Uh, to start, big thank you to staff for all the work that went into this final report and the changes that you guys made. Um, it was a lot of time and effort there and we appreciate it. Uh, considering that though, we do still have a couple overarching concerns. Uh, first off, we noticed that most of the data relied on for the listing process in our watershed is 10 to 20 years old and was frequently based on just one or two data points. While response to our comments on this point noted the need for additional submission of data points to CEDIN, that does not excuse the lack of current data and reliance on decades, decades old data. Uh, it should not be the burden of the public to provide the data that is necessary to make the decisions that go into these listing processes. It is definitely a good thing to allow the sublimation uh, the supplementing of data by the public to make the data more robust, but we should not be primarily responsible for the cost to go into collection and measuring if we want to make sure that the most recent data is being considered. Um, there's a lot of requirements to go into it and it's just a very time, I mean, obviously for both sides, it's a timely and costly procedure. Uh, we understand the state budget is largely responsible for this failure, um, but it's not acceptable and needs to be addressed. Like we can't be relying on impairment or making impairment decisions based on data that's two decades old. Um, and this goes for all water policies. We, we just need more up-to-date data. Um, and secondly, we would like to make note of the current deadline. Uh, this was just kind of briefly addressed, so I'm kind of winging it a little bit more here, sorry. Um, but the current deadline for data solicitation for the 2024 integrated report is October 16, 2020, uh, that already passed. And then the change sheet also came out that same day, October 16th, 2020. And um, so I know that it's not gonna be, it's not being proposed for a future listing, not necessarily the 2022 listing that was in the first change sheet, but like if any other new data is necessary because of those deadlines, that can't be considered until like the 2026 and 2028 integrated reports with this four year process. Um, so it's just, it just doesn't show like an adequate picture and kind of ties hands on the listing for, from our point of view anyway, um, 
because you literally can't use the data until later on. And like, we understand that there's like an extensive, huge amounts of data to go through. Like that's very timely and it's, there's just a lot to do. And so well, maybe like a two year process or just moving up that deadline or being a little bit more flexible in that four year deadline um, would just make it so that we have a more adequate picture of the water status or like the health of our water status in this state and just hope for further reconsideration on that point. And generally, I just encourage the water board to prioritize, to always prioritize monitoring and improving water quality. Thank you again, and hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neary. And thanks for uh, the good comment when it comes to needing to better acquire data and that it can't just be on, on the public. I know when it comes to the data that gets put into CEDIN, uh, that our determinations on the 303D list are made is from all sources um, and many a time uh, from um, permittees themselves. And so it is, uh, it, it, we need to continue to uh, better finance and resource the acquisition and characterization of our water bodies. Uh, but um, I appreciate that. Ms. Fitzgerald, do you have any, any uh, comments on that point? Yeah, just a little bit of a side comment. I know, Ms. Larry, you're from the Russian River Riverkeeper, and I thought that I might just put in a plug for some of the monitoring efforts that are happening in the North Coast region right now to establish a Russian River Regional Monitoring Program in order to try to um, identify data gaps that we have and, and then fill those gaps um, in order to help inform the integrated report as well as follow up with their pathogen TMDL. Um, and so uh, we're we are very um, interested in, in a more broad sense, we're very interested in trying to get all of the useful receiving water and ambient water data and pull that in and use it for our integrated report. And we're also interested in trying to reduce the amount of time between our data cutoff date and when we actually bring this to the board and um, are very much looking forward to trying to institute some improvements to this process in order to try to make that happen. That's good to hear, thank you. Great. Thank you both. Much appreciated. Uh, okay. Well, that brings us to the end of our commenters that were wishing to comment both on the North Coast list and the state list. Um, and uh, so now we'll transition back to the uh, staff presentation for for now the, the whole statewide list. And, uh, and then we'll move through public comment for those, which uh, seeing about 10 individuals just for uh, timing for folks. Um, We'll try to get through those and then hit our lunch. Um, and so, uh, Ms. Weber, take it away. Thank you. Um, can you guys all hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, okay great. Um, I, I, it sounded like uh, there was some, I apologize, I think there were some uh, sound issues on my end with the, with my earlier part of the presentation. So hopefully this is a little bit better. Um, next slide, please. I'll just launch into the, to the statewide list. <clears throat> so in this um, last half of the presentation, I'm gonna be talking about the proposed listing decisions that were previously adopted by regional water boards um, and that were subsequently requested for state board review. Um, so these include listing decisions approved by both the Lahontan and the Colorado River Regional Water Boards, um, both of whom were on cycle for 2018, um, as well as some uh, decisions approved by the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, uh, which made off-cycle decisions in the 2018 cycle. Next slide, please. Uh, starting with bacteria in the Lahontan region, um, so for the 2018 listing cycle, the Lahontan Regional Water Board assessed attainment of the municipal and domestic supply or MUN beneficial use using a fecal coliform bacteria water quality objective um, in the, from their basin plan, from their regional basin plan. Um, and they also used the statewide E. coli water quality objective to assess the recreational or Rec 1 beneficial uses. Um, we received comments opposed to the region's use of their fecal coliform uh, uh, or listing based on their fecal coliform objective. Um, and these were based for several reasons. Uh, commenters said that uh, the fecal coliform objective 
uh, should not be used to assess immune beneficial use uh, because it had been historically used in the region um, to assess the REC1 beneficial use. Also, we heard that um, the, they were opposed to the use of the fecal coliform objective because it's too stringent, uh, inappropriate to, uh, for protecting raw receiving water. Um, and they pointed out that the region has begun a planning process to evaluate whether the objective should be revised. Um, in our responses, we noted that the Lahontan region's fecal objective was properly used to assess immune. Um, that's because it was, um, because the objective itself applies to surface waters in the region and has relevance to the immune use. Uh, fecal coliform is a bacterial indicator used to assess risk to humans of ingestion of water. Um, it, and it was also used appropriately in prior cycles to assess the REC1 use um, because at that time the statewide bacteria objective had not been adopted. Although we do note that the Regional Water Board is currently evaluating their fecal coliform objective through a basin plan amendment process. And in the draft resolution for this item, uh, recital 12 states that if the fecal coliform objective is revised through a basin plan amendment, um, the State Water Board expects that the Regional Water Board will reassess the water bodies using this new objective the next time it is on cycle for the integrated report. Uh, recital 12 of this draft Resolution also says that the state board expects that any waters listed as impaired by the fecal coliform objective would not be scheduled for a TMDL development until after the basin planning effort has been completed. Um, so in conclusion, we do not recommend changing the regional board's proposed bacteria listing based on exceedances of the fecal coliform objectives. Next slide, please. The next slide, uh, this uh, slide relates to proposed listings for turbidity and manganese of, of the Colorado River. So the, the Colorado River Water Board adopted turbidity and manganese listing recommendations for portions of the Colorado River. Um, they used recommended levels for turbidity and manganese from secondary maximum contaminant levels or secondary MCLs um, as evaluation guidelines. Um, as you um, may know secondary MCLs are taste and odor thresholds for, for drinking water. Uh, the commenters maintain that the regional board had inappropriately utilized secondary MCLs as, a, as evaluation guidelines for the Colorado River. Um, they also pointed out that the, the Colorado River is naturally turbid and that higher turbidity levels benefit native fish in the water, in the water body. In our response to comments, we maintain that the regional board appropriately used the secondary NCLs as numeric evaluation guidelines in accordance with the listing policy. Um, that is that substances and concentrations that, concentrations that cause adverse taste and odors um, may be considered as impairments to the immune beneficial use. However, the regional board has options for responding to the proposed listings uh, in the draft resolution for this item. In recital 13, it acknowledges that the regional board may consider development of site-specific objectives for these constituents. Um, they may also consider using alternative evaluation guidelines to assess attainment of the new use, um, so long as they are appropriate under the listing policy. Um, and uh, here again in recital 13, we, we um, it states that the state board um, expects that the TMDL but any TMDL project to address these listings would not commence until after the regional board determines which response is most appropriate. Um, so in conclusion, for these listings, we do not recommend changing the regional water board's proposed turbidity and manganese listings for portions of the Colorado River. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, for the next few slides, I'll be going over the um, proposed decision in the San Francisco Bay regional uh, region. Um, first, I will discuss Los Gatos Creek. Uh, the regional board has adopted a recommendation to list lower Los Gatos Creek on the 303D list as impaired for temperature. Uh, temperature levels in the creek do not support the designated aquatic life beneficial uses, which include cold freshwater habitat and migration of aquatic organisms. 
um, one, of, one of the first uh, sets of comments we received from the commenters was that um, they maintain that prior to evaluating impairment, uh, the water board must prove that a use is existing. Uh, in our responses, we noted that the state's obligation under Section 303D of the Clean Water Act is to identify waters that do not meet water quality standards. Um, that is that determining whether a use is existing, an existing use is primarily relevant to whether a state may remove the use from its water quality standards and is not relevant to a state's obligation to assess its water quality standards under Section 303D. Um, Section 303D. Next slide, please. Again, continuing on with Los Gatos Creek, the commenters asserted that the temperature threshold utilized as evaluation guidelines to assess attainment of the aquatic life beneficial uses in the creek are inappropriate because they were developed for steelhead in the Pacific Northwest. In our responses, we explain that the narrative temperature objective in the Regional Water Board Basin Plan relies on a de determination of the water body's natural receiving water temperature. Uh, because of the long history of human impact in Los Gatos Creek, the data do not exist to determine natural receiving water temperature in this water body. So in response, staff followed the listing policy guidance to interpret the narrative objectives and compared recent temperature data with temperature requirements of aquatic life, in this case, steelhead. Four temperature evaluation guidelines were selected, which are protective of different life cycle requirements of steelhead. The temperature thresholds that were selected are based on temperatures that support salmonids in the Pacific Northwest, including California, and have been used to support temperature assessments in the San Francisco Bay, North Coast, and Central Valley regions for numerous integrated report cycles that have been approved by US EPA. Um, I would like also to turn your attention to back to change sheet number one at the first page, which would add a new recital 14 to the draft resolution. Um, this begins by acknowledging, acknowledging that the temperature thresholds were properly used for the listing decision. Um, but continuing on, recital 14 states that the Santa Clara Santa Clara Valley Water District, also known as Valley Water, uh, intends to fund a complete and more region-specific temperature study for water bodies um, with steelhead fisheries um, affected by their operations and intends to coordinate with the San Francisco Regional Water Board and, stakeho and stakeholders on the development of the study. Um, it is estimated that this study would be completed by January of 2023. The new recital explains that if the regional water board determines the study meets the requirements of the listing policy, it may be used to reassess the Los Gatos Creek temperature listing decisions in a subsequent listing cycle. Uh, finally, recital 14 also states that the state board's expectation is that the development of a TMDL to address this listing would remain a low priority pending completion and regional board evaluation of the temperature study. Uh, so in conclusion, we do not recommend changing the regional board's proposed listing of Los Gatos Creek as impaired for temperature. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. Um, this is Napa River and Sonoma Creek nutrient D listings. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Regional Board has also adopted a recommendation to delist the non-tidal portions of the Napa River and Sonoma Creek for nutrients in the 2018 cycle uh, based on attainment of aquatic life and immune beneficial uses. Uh, we received comments in opposition to the proposed delisting, suggesting that a listing decision, the listing decision cannot be approved without compliance with CEQA. Uh, additionally, commenters provided photographs showing algae growth in the Napa River uh, to support their assertion that the beneficial uses are impaired but, um, due to algae growth. Uh, in regards to CEQA, the State Board's approval of the 303D list is not subject to CEQA because the list does not qualify as a CEQA project. Um, because in this case, determining water quality standards, de determining whether water quality standards are met has no potential to result in any direct or indirect physical change to the environment. Um, as well, the justification to delist Napa River and Sonoma Creek for nutrients was based on a situation-specific weight of evidence approach 
as um, in described in the listing policy um, for the evaluation for the evaluation of the uh, for this evaluation, the regional board conducted a, a systematic study that collected data on indicators of eutrophication, such as algae co cover, at representative locations throughout both water bodies. Uh, evaluation of the data showed that the Napa River and Sonoma Creek are not impaired for nutrients because they had a low rate of exceedances of these applicable of applicable guidelines for for these indicators of eutrophication. The photographic evidence provided by the commenter showed, uh, did show patches of algae growth in the river. Uh, however, photographs of algae cannot be translated into the measures of algae cover consistent with the data collected by the regional board. Um, and the evidence presented by the photographs was not sufficient to outweigh the algae cover and other data collected by the board, by the regional board, um, which do demonstrate attainment of water quality standards in these water bodies. So in conclusion, we do not recommend changing the regional board's proposed delisting of uh, delistings of the Napa River and Sonoma Creek for nutrients. Next slide, please. So this concludes my presentation for today. Uh, we're here to answer questions, and we also have representatives from the regional water boards available online to answer questions as needed. Thank you so much, Ms. Weber. I don't think I have any questions. Uh, fellow board members? Okay, hearing none, I think we can move on to our uh, comments. Um, first, I'd like to call up Ms. Tess Dunham. Hello. Hello. Good morning, or at least it's still morning, morning for a short time period. Uh, thank you. And I was um, here today, uh, Tess Denham with Conserves and Conway and representing Centennial Livestock. And we have provided comments with respect to the application of the 20 fecal coliform objective that the Lahontan Regional Board has used in this listing process. Um, specifically, we have grave concerns with some of the process that has occurred and how this, um, the 20 fecal coliform, which historically by the Lahontan board has always been associated with the REC1 beneficial use standard. And that is what the standard has been used for all previous listing cycles. All of a sudden now the water board, the Lahontan board switched justifications and claims that the 20 fecal coliform is necessary and associated with the municipal beneficial use. This is a shift of, you know, 20 years plus of how they have used the fecal coliform objective. And what concerns me the most is we seem to have this post hoc rationaliz rationalization that has just continued to evolve with every comment period. And that gives me grave concern that at the time that a listing is proposed by a regional board, that justification and everything that goes with it should be laid out. There shouldn't be a post hoc rationalization that comes apart as every response to comments. And in fact, we have some concerns with some of the response to comments and the revisions in the final staff report that are being provided here at the state board level, some that are expansions of what was provided below and some that are new rationalizations as to what was provided below. So I want to walk through a little bit, um, not try to spend too much time on the response to comments, but do want to respond to some of the rationali rationalizations that have been provided. I also want to call out, there was a key point that was made in the presentation by Lori when she was talking about the Lahontan region and the MUN, and you'll notice that the per bullet point was they have found that MUN is relevant with respect to the fecal coliform objective. In contrast, when talking about the secondary MCLs and how it is related to the MUN, they talk about how the secondary MCLs are appropriate for determining whether the municipal beneficial use is being protected or not, not whether it's relevant or not. We need to keep the integrity in our listing process and really look at the beneficial uses that apply and the standards that are associated with that use, not a relevant standard, which I don't believe is a legal standard. So going starting first on page 158 of the response to comments, and this is just a quick note that there is in the response to comments down on the bottom of the page, it makes reference that the Lahontan Region Basin Plan is a water quality planning strategy document to achieve water quality goals. Obviously, I think that's an understatement 
basin plans or regulations, and water quality objectives have regulatory purposes and intent. We all know that if I came to this board and say we don't need to worry about a water quality objective, it's just a goal, you all would um, probably send me packing on my way. So I do think we need to be clear in our characterization of what a basin plan is. Moving on to page 159, how I understand the rationalization that's now being provided in this response to comments, if you look in the middle, there's a sentence that says the fecal coliform objective applies to all of the region's surface waters to which both Rec 1 and municipal uses apply. I think it's expansive to say that just because the fecal coliform objective is not specifically associated with the beneficial use in the basin plan and you have Rec 1 and MUN, that the two are automatically associated with each other. I think it's a stretch. For Rec 1 in the Basin Plan, there is explicit narrative language in the beneficial use section that clearly ties the Rec 1 and the fecal coliform objective together. As far as my, in my reading of the Basin Plan, I find no comparable language that ties MUN to that you know, generic fecal coliform standard. Moving forward, we then go to page 160 and 161. There's this whole new justification that, well, when Alexis Strauss issued an approval letter in 2000 for amendments that occurred in 1994, that um, there was a statement or a sentence that the rationale was based upon the fact that the sources of drinking water have now determined that all the waters are MUN and therefore this justifies requiring a greater level of protection for fecal, for fecal coliform contamination. That's a pretty broad statement to then make the inference that is being made that this means that the fecal coliform objective in the basin plan as it exists was there or is being used for protection of MUN. Going forward with some of the other new um, comments that have been provided, as we go into page 162 and 163, some of these arguments started at the regional board level. They've continued to evolve. Now there's arguments how with you know, use of 1973 memorandum that were issued to contractors when the 1975 basin plan was being developed. Um, I'll wrap up very quickly. I know I'm out of time that you know, this is a evidence as to why the 20 fecal coliform is appropriate. I think it's important to note in 1975, the fecal coliform objective applied to specific water bodies for the recreational beneficial use. It was later expanded well after the 1973 memorandums were issued and nowhere does it say that the 1973 memorandums were supportive. Last point I'll just make is there's new arguments on page 163 how the 20 fecal coliform from the surface water treatment rule is an evaluation guideline. I just wanna note that nowhere in the Lahontan board's process did they go through the required process in the listing policy with respect to selecting this as the evaluation guideline. So in short, have major concerns with this evolving post hoc rationalization and how we now have a new beneficial use tied to a fecal coliform objective um, just through the listing process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Uh, there's a lot to unpack, obviously, in the points that you've made. Uh, you know, I would just uh, say if, if Mr. Bishop or anyone else has any uh, immediate comment, but otherwise uh, appreciate the, your disagreement with, it seems, uh, what's been rationalized or, or put on paper at this point. Uh, Ms. Gillespie. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Um, yeah, there was a lot of uh, comments there, um, I think, worthy of unpacking a little bit. Um, I think that um, Tess makes a, a good point that seemingly there's a different standard used, whether it's relevant or appropriate. And I would like to point out that those standards apply to different things that are occurring with this listing process. Um, we identified that evaluation guidelines for temperature were appropriate evaluation guidelines under the listing policy. Um, with respect to our use of the word relevant here, what we're talking about is we have an actual numeric uh, fecal coliform objective that is in the basin plan. 
and we're simply saying that it needs to be assessed and it does have relevance to the immune use. And so um, it, the basin plan requires that it be assessed. And if you take a look at all of the basin plans for all the nine regions, every single one of them has a handful at least uh, water quality objectives that aren't expressly linked to the beneficial use to which it uh, protects. And so we use the term relevance to suggest that, you know, to the extent that the regional board um, is utilizing it to assess immune at this point in time, we think that it's appropriate to do so. Um, we wouldn't propose to initiate a new rule during our listing process um, that says you can't evaluate a standard unless the objective expressly is linked to a beneficial use. So with that consideration, we thought it appropriate to use um, the fecal coliform objective to assess for uh, the mean beneficial use. It is true that historically it has been used to assess REC1. Um, and as you recall, of course, we did the statewide water quality um, plan that established bacteria objectives um, statewide. And at that time, we did not have the E. coli objective supersede the fecal coliform objective in the Mahon region because it was really a scope issue of the project. So the statewide plan, um, the scope of the project was to update basin plans that had uh, water quality objectives for bacteria that were expressly linked to REC1. Um, and so the state board left the region's fecal coliform objective alone, um, acknowledging that it had relevance to other uses, certainly not just REC1. And so with that in the adopting resolution for the statewide water quality objective, we acknowledge that the region thus does have two um, bacteria objectives and waters would be assessed with those two until the region undertakes a planning action to evaluate um, the efficacy, the relevance, the usefulness of the, uh, or the currentness of the fecal coliform objective. And they're currently undertaking that planning project now. Um, and so, as uh, Lori mentioned, we do have in the recital um, some discussion that we would expect that there wouldn't be a TMDL developed for these fecal listings until um, after that planning project evaluating the, um, the fecal coliform objective um, you know, results. Separately, um, and finally, I think with respect to whether the fecal is, is inappropriate or too stringent to um, use for uh, municipal domestic drinking water, um, I would just point to the basin plan for the Lahontan region. And it really acknowledges that the method that it utilizes to develop their water quality objectives, it's based on um, the limited information on many of the water bodies in the region, coupled with a lot of uh, limited human impact on a lot of the waters in the region. Um, and in recognition of those facts in the region, they did elect to set objectives um, higher than perhaps the most sensitive use would require. So that's the approach that they took. Um, and so, um, you know, really what our goal here today is to assess the standards um, as currently encompassed in the basin plan. Thank you, Ms. Pelosi. Yes. Yeah. So I. Um, I'm trying to follow along here and I'm having some challenges, but um, it seems that there's um, uh, a differing view between uh, what Ms. Dunham is reading and Ms. Gillespie, what you're outlining. So, um, and, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, Ms. Gillespie, but you're, you're disagreeing with Ms. Dunham's um, interpretation as to the effect of um, what's contained in the listing? I didn't speak specifically, um, Vice Chair, to the effect of the listing, except to say that any, um, you know, when, when water bodies are, are listed, the, the, the expectation is some re regulatory measure will, will occur to respond to that impaired impairment determination 
and that nothing will be done so with respect to this listing until after the region completes its planning project um, to identify whether the fecal coliform objective is appropriate or needs to be revised. If the region does revise that objective, then what recital 12 says is that we would expect that the these listings for MUN be reassessed uh, if the standard is, is updated or revised um, in the next listing cycle and then a TMDL not be developed until that time allows for that process. Okay, so uh, it, it seems to me then that, and maybe Ms. Dunham, if you could uh, respond, you're focusing on response to comments and um, some of the statements that were included in the response to comments that would could potentially lead one to believe that an objective um, is being established. And it sounds like recital 12 is assuming that there would be further action in the event that there's further action by the regional board. And so I'm just trying to better understand um, is your focus uh, just on the response to comments or do, have you taken a look at recital 12 to see if that addresses your concerns or do you believe that recital 12 is inconsistent with the response to comments? Um, so going maybe backwards, I recital 12 is fine. Appreciate the fact that there is the, you know, pushing off of any TMDL until the water board finishes their review of the water quality objective. Our fundamental concern or my fundamental concern is in the listing process, we have now coupled this fecal coliform objective to the municipal beneficial use in a formal way, right? We're not just, you know, while the um, slide here says, well, we think it's relevant to what the 303D listing process has now done is said, the fecal coliform objective is used to determine if the water body is meeting the municipal or domestic beneficial use, right? And so, you know, and you know, we still have our process with respect to what happens in Lahan as to the yeah. validity of that fecal coliform objective, but nowhere in the history of this basin plan that I've seen was it ever really evaluated under 13241 and the whole 13240 process that the 20 fecal coliform objective was necessary and appropriate and set at an appropriate level to protect the municipal beneficial use. And as Stacy said, they're finding, well, we find it relevant to, but I don't think a determination of impairment for the beneficial use should be made based upon relevance. It should be based upon, is the beneficial use being actually impaired? And then I saw Mr. Bishop was about to jump in earlier. Did you have anything to add? Well, I just wanted to point out that what the um, the response to comments are um, discussions about staff's rationale. The listing itself is the um, issue under regulation. It is not the response to comments. And so the um, the listing is based on a water quality objective in the basin plan that is being exceeded. We recognize that the um, the regional board is uh, undertaking a, um, a reassessment of that water quality objective. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. I seem I'm I'm satisfied insofar as the 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 determination here. But Vice Chair, um, well, do you have I think I, I think for me and Mr. Bishop, that's that's helpful. But I just hate to have us leave this with. Um, uh, a situation of uh, where it's not clear. And so I just like to go back to Miss Dunham. Um, I mean, what, what would your request be in moving forward? You say you appreciate recital 12 and take in light of, you know, Mr. Bishop's comments and Miss Gillespie's that this, you know, would be later determined by the regional board. Uh, what more are you asking for? So what we were asking for below and in our review up to the state water board was where there were listings that were specifically determined on the 20 fecal coliform under the so-called protection of the municipal beneficial use, they basically should not have been included. 
Now that doesn't do away with it, most of the bacteria listings for the Lahontan region because they also still applied the state's recreational standard and many of them still exceeded that standard. But we are concerned that we're, you know, we're never going to now be able to decouple MUN from this, from this fecal coliform objective as it currently stands. It is now a formal action saying that beneficial use, the municipal beneficial use in the Lahontan region um, uh, that the fecal coliform objective is designed to protect that municipal beneficial use. It's going to make it much harder in that evaluation process that the regional board goes through to decouple those with this statement that's been done within them, this listing process. And um, to, to respond to that, if I may, um, you know, I would just to quickly add that um, the listing, um, the integrated report is not a regulation. So what is done here today and any, any linkage, um, it, it does not amend the region's basin plan. The region itself is taking a look at uh, is the fecal objective good? Uh, what should it, what use would it, might it relate to? What waters might it relate to? And so they will be refining that or revising that, um, uh, presumably. Um, and so it, it is true that it has not historically been used in the listing process for immune. Um, and but it's it's just it's been on the books. It's 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 acknowledged in the grazing waiver um, that I know Ms. Dunham is concerned with with her clients. Um, so it hasn't been really you know it hasn't taken the focal point before. But that doesn't mean to suggest that it is limited to fecal uh, rec one. Indeed, when it was associated with rec one, the objection was that it was too stringent and unnecessarily um, stringent to protect inadvertent uh, ingestion of water due to recreation. And so, you know, we do hear the objection with this objective, either way you slice it. And I think that's why the regional board is undertaking their planning action to take a look at it. And if I may, I'll just add that should there be an amendment of the Lahontan Region Basin Plan to clarify the fecal coliform objective and its use, then after that's complete, the next integrated report cycle we would be then assessing data based on those changes to that objective. So what we would do here in the 2018 cycle is not set in stone. If there's a revision through the appropriate basin plan um, public process, then we consider that um, change to the next time we do our integrated report. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to ask a question because I feel like, you know, we just had a similar a discussion on the Russian River and the re, you know the reasons and the rationale for putting off that decision are different here, right? That was the data analysis um, step that needs to happen. This is a different issue. We're talking about beneficial use coupling and reaching in um, to a historical basin plan for the Lahontan region that's currently undergoing an update. And so as a board member here, I feel like I need to understand whether there's an opportunity to push off this decision until the next cycle, just recognizing that this is a work in progress, it sounds like. Um, and so if, if someone could please respond to that, I, I just want to know what options are on the table. Sure, so the, the big difference that we have here is this um, is a longstanding water quality objective in the um, Lahontan Basin Plan that was compared to um, data and that data exceeded that um, that objective. We don't, I don't believe that we have the um, authority or the, or maybe not the authority that um, it is good public policy for us to decide which um, objectives we're going to um, support in basin plans and which ones we're not. That's really what is being asked is that there's an existing water quality objective and that you should not um, list based on that objective because um, folks don't like the objective. We agree that there needs to be an analysis done on that objective because it is an outlier in bacteria objectives around the state. And um, we have indicated that we would like to see that done prior to any TMDL being adopted. But the difference between this and the North Coast is that we had new data um, and um, errors in the data 
Here we have a long-standing water quality objective that folks don't like. I could jump in and ask Mr. Bishop to make a connection for me. How does that water quality objective, the one that's being exceeded, how does that objective protect the MUN beneficial use? So um, the in the basin plan itself, there's no linkage to any beneficial use in the basin plan. Um, the, um, the MUN use is a use that is relevant because it is um, it has a lower standard than the 20, but it is not linked directly in the basin plan. And um, I think that is Tessa's biggest issue is that um, the wording in the listing that links it to the MUN. Um, so, I would- So, so Mr. Mister, I actually, I'm not asking about, cause I'm not a lawyer. I'm not asking about the language that links it. I'm actually asking from, a practical perspective, how does that quality objective protect so, the MUN beneficial use? So uh, I don't think I can answer that question the way you're asking it. The, the basin plan didn't link it. It had a water quality objective. Many of our basin plans um, earlier on had um, beneficial uses and water quality objectives, but they were not necessarily linked. Um, as we adopt new um, water quality objectives today, we always are careful to link them to the beneficial use that they're protecting. But that was not always done in the past. And so we have a water quality objective there that is related to public health. It's a bacteria. And so the, the areas where bacteria um, could impact public health are through recreation and municipal. That's the, the logical linkage, but it's not in the basin plan that way. I Thank you. I needed, even if it, it's a logical linkage, I needed some understanding of that linkage. And are, are you finished board member Dota? Yes. I have a follow-up. Um, and then Mr. Bishop, what about the concern that Ms. Denham uh, expressed regarding um, uh, the inability to decouple. So when this goes back for review, would there be as part of that analysis, um, the ability to decouple? So I, I think as, um, as our attorney mentioned, there, that this is a um, listing document. It doesn't infer into the basin plan a coupling. It is a discussion of the logic of, of that. Um, but it doesn't confer that now in the basin plan, it's linked where it hadn't been before. Um, I do believe that it's always been linked to those two um, issues because those are the, um, the bacteria um, protections are for human health and they are based on either recreation or MUN or both. And um, I can't tell you the reason why the Lahattan board X number of years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, used um, assigned 20 to them, um, but they did. And Anything further, Vice Chair? Um, I, 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 hopefully, Ms. Dunham, that will be help you as you, that will help you as you go forward. I think the discussion was helpful for, for me anyway. And thanks for, thank you, Chair, for indulging in the conversation. Of course, it was helpful for me as well. And, you know, thank you, Ms. Dunham. Uh, I think, again, there's, uh, there's an inferred coupling, I think, for you uh, going back down into the basin plan from this determination here. But I think clearly for us, it's, it's less so. And what I'm hearing is that there is already a robust process and discussion to further air out and figure out what is the right number for the Lahontan region here and how to handle this you know, longstanding, I know, issue that it, we've touched on, I think, a number of times through the last four years. Um, but I, I appreciate the, the, um, the vigilance on the issue and uh, certainly the advocacy for your clients here and ensuring that you know, we're not, again, I think there's a question mark, it's being further developed, further refined at the, the regional board level and will actually impact total maximum daily limit loads or you know, actual regulatory then uh, requirements and or uh, issues of concern. So I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Tom. And thank you everyone for the time around the discussion. I thought it was uh, more than appropriate and look forward to further around it. Uh, next up, I believe we have here uh, on the cards, Ray uh, Tahir. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Oh, yes, it is an afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Chair Esquivel and board members. Uh, my name is Ray Tahir, and I'd like to make some brief comments concerning the counter uh, comments in response to the state board's comments regarding the proposed statewide Clean Water Act Section 303D list. Uh, let's begin with the removal of lead from the California Toxics Rule in two, uh, 2018. Uh, the state board's agreement to remove lead as a, a TMDL for all reaches in the LA River and its tributaries is greatly appreciated. But could the state board issue an advisory informing the LA board that lead is no longer a TMDL for uh, LA River uh, reaches and its tributaries? Next, um, CTR and ambient monitoring. In my comments, I mentioned that CTR water quality standards are ambient based. I asserted that ambient means sampling before and after a storm event. State board staff countered by saying that CTR says nothing about the ambient condition of a water body being either before or after a storm event. That's correct. However, CTR water quality standards are ambient standards. So are others, including uh, bacteria and nutrients. The problem is that the state board has not provided a definition of ambient, despite the fact that its need has been called to its attention almost 10 years ago. This is odd given the US EPA has issued so many guidance documents dealing with ambient water quality. Almost all the TMDLs adopted by RB4 contain references to ambient monitoring. I, I, was I supposed to say advance the slide? <laughs> now let's not worry about it. Could you advance? Yeah, apologies. We didn't. I didn't uh, realize there was a, a slide up here. Okay. Boom. Another one. One more. Okay. Here's US EPA's definition of ambient water quality. It's a natural concentration of water quality constituents prior to mixing of either point or non-point source load contaminant. Contaminant. Sorry. Right. Reference ambient concentration is used to indicate the concentration of a chemical that will not cause adverse impact to human health. EPA's definition comes close to being usable, but should be clear and expanded to include all pollutants that could cause an adverse impact on aquatic life and wildlife, as well as on human health, which appears to be focused on bacteria. Um, despite the absence of a clear definition, there are clues that indicate that ambient means the condition of a water body during dry weather. Next slide, please. Um, in State Board Order 2001-15, it makes clear that water quality standards are not wet weather standards, meaning, of course, that they are dry weather standards. Swamp units, including RB4s, have conducted pollutant monitoring, but only during dry weather. And general swamp guidelines say all swamp-funded bioassessments shall include sampling during the most appropriate index period, that is, time of year that samples are collected. Since the appropriate index period varies at different latitudes and elevations, southern latitudes are generally sampled in late spring, and northern latitude sites are generally sampled in the late summer. This guidance will vary uh, with the project boundaries. Next slide, please. My favorite de de definition comes from Rockland County, South Carolina Stormwater Program. Uh, they define ambient as water quality monitoring that involves testing of streams, rivers, and lakes during normal flow conditions. Samples are taken and test tested when the effect of runoff from rainfall events is not present. This provides information regarding the overall quality of water at these locations. The natural water quality of our rivers, lakes, and streams can be influenced by a variety of factors that are detected through ambient monitoring. I think we all know this. The state board should consider using this definition. The effects of rainfall not present could be, say, 48 hours or uh, before or after a rain event. The absence of a definition for ambient water has been a long-standing problem 
that needs immediate resolution. And perhaps we can work with the state board in coming up with a de definition and including it in Portico alone. Uh, next slide, please. Um, my, my comment regarding a TMDL cannot be a TMDL unless it is on the 303 uh, D list was met with some disagreement. Uh, the staff person said a 303 D listing is not a prerequisite for TMDL development. A TMDL may be developed for water bodies that are not previously listed as impaired on the 303 D list. As discussed in water quality uh, control policy for addressing impaired waters, uh, regular stru regulatory structure and, and options. And this was uh, by way of a uh, state board resolution 2005-0050. That is true. A 303 D listing is not a prerequisite for TMDL development when it has not been developed. Obviously it has been developed. We're talking about after a TMDL has been developed. Before a TMDL can be a TMDL for a reach or a water quality segment, Monetary data must show exceedances of water quality standard sufficient to be on the 303D list. In the case of metals, which are CTR applicable, uh, listing a TMDL is de determined, as you know, by a statistical case, the bi uh, binomial distribution for toxicants, uh, which is dealt with on the table 3.1 of the state's policy for developing California's clean water section 303D list. I mentioned that regional board four placed into the current permit TMDLs that are not 303 delisted, but have been delisted based on state policy. Take for example, the Meadows TMDL for the San Gabriel River. It was developed and adopted by USC. Metals for REACH three and REACH one are incorrectly less listed as TMDLs in the permit, despite the fact that all the metals, copper, lead, selenium, and zinc were delisted for these reaches from the 2010-2012 and from the 2014-2016 303 D-list. The D-lists were based on exceedance monitoring in keeping with table 3.1 as reflected in the decision-making ID sheets on the and on the 303 D spreadsheets. Mr. Let me uh, just uh, like you've uh, you've gone through your time at this point. I got so 10 seconds time. and I'm out. I'm out of here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Lead for reach two of the San Gabriel River was not delisted, but should have been because the data was 10 years old and lead is a legacy pollutant. That concludes my presentation. And thank you very much for your indulgence. I'm sorry for going over. Oh, it's it's more than OK. Thank you, Mr. Tahir, for your, your good yeah, comment. My pleasure. Uh, you know, I would I would actually ask when it comes to the definition of, of ambient, if there is any um, thought from uh, folks, Ms. Fitzgerald. Yeah, um, so we tend to not really have a definition that we use per se within the integrated report for ambient. When we get data in for a particular water body, we look and at the data and we compare it to uh, the water quality objectives and the use. For the most part, our objectives and our uses apply throughout the entire year. There are a few instances where there is some sort of a seasonal condition. For example, I think probably the one we're most all familiar with is the limited rec one use, in which case we would only look at objectives associated with that use during a certain time of the year. Otherwise, we um, work under the, um, the approach that those standards, our standards need to um, be attained and we look at whether or not data attain or not throughout the entire course of the year. So the concern about just looking at dry weather conditions versus wet weather conditions is not one we really consider within the integrated report. It comes up more, I think, when you're starting to work on source control and implementation actions and actually trying to um, address the, the causes of the impairment. I, that's very helpful. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. I appreciate that. Ms. Gillespie, do you have anything to add? Yes, I just wanted to add a sort of a procedural element to this comment. Um, it addresses a water body and, and pollutant combination um, out of the LA region that's not before the board and it's not a part of the integrated report. So I didn't know if that was made clear or not, but you know, the LA region is acting off cycle and, and didn't consider this water body whatsoever. So we're not in the position to review it at this time. That's helpful as well. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, to hear. I appreciate your comments. And uh, to flag, yes, uh, the board isn't uh, making any uh, uh, approval.
approval or determination on the LA region's specific uh, body uh, or an, and or impairments in this cycle. But your, your comments are still welcome. So thank you. Uh, next, we have Susan Paulson. And I'll flag, I believe, uh, it looks like the next five commenters are from all from Santa Clara Valley Water District. I don't know if uh, you wanted to organize as a panel there or uh, just go through each uh, each individual. So, but we'll start with you, Ms. Paulson. Good day. Sure, thank you, no problem. And I think the other um, attendees are on in an as needed basis. So if questions come up. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, uh, my name is Susan Paulson. I'm a principal engineer with Exponent, and I'm here on behalf of the Santa Clara Valley Water District, also known as Scattos Creek, as impaired by temperature to protect steelhead. Um, first, on behalf of Valley Water, I would uh, very much like to thank the board members and board staff for meeting with us and for developing the change sheet that includes findings that are intended to help us find a path forward. Valley Water's concerns relate to the use of the Pacific Northwest Temperature Evaluation Guidelines uh, that were derived for salmonid species other than steelhead. And just to be clear, those are not water quality objectives in the basin plan, like was part of the prior discussion. Um, is specifically, Valley Water believes that these evaluation guidelines are not appropriate for our region, are not based on the best recent science, and have not been attained since at least the 1950s when measurements, temperature measurements in Los Gatos Creek began. In addition, there's a large and growing body of evidence that indicates that California steelhead are adapted to temperatures that are warmer than these guidelines. And with regard to these guidelines, EPA is, I think, recognizing this fact as well. They recently have indicated that there is an open and legitimate scientific question about the adaptability of salmonid populations to warmer conditions in California. And that's a, a quote from a letter um, that EPA authored. In response to these concerns, Valley Water has committed to funding and leading a regional temperature study to determine temperatures that are protective of steelhead in steelhead streams that are affected by its operations. The scientific study would culminate in a report that would be submitted per, for peer review. And the regional board and other stakeholders would be invited to participate in the regional temperature study, which could include additional streams if other water management agencies provide funding as well. In addition, Valley Water has begun implementation of what it calls the FACE agreement in the watershed that includes Los Gatos Creek. Uh, FACE is a fisheries habitat restoration and enhanced flow management program. And Valley Water is convening an adaptive management team this month actually, implementing a pilot study that began last week and preparing a draft EIR to be released for public review in, in the spring. Valley Water was concerned that including the Los Gatos Creek on the section 303D list could have a number of unintended consequences one would be in effect making the uh, Pacific Northwest evaluation guidelines de facto water quality objectives and potentially causing unintended uh, consequences to Valley Waters resource management and groundwater recharge, recharge operations or affecting the implementation of the FACE program. It also obviously has the potential to result in the need to prepare a TMDL and we feared to force the development of either site-specific objectives or use attainability analyses. And we, we believe that these outcomes would be premature if a regional temperature study is to be conducted in order to determine the temperatures that would be protective of steelhead. So for this reason, Valley Water very much appreciates and supports the inclusions, inclusion of findings in change sheet one in order to allow time for the regional temperature study to be performed and for the listing to be evaluated against any new temperature evaluation guidelines that might result from that study. We recognize that the study could result in a range of outcomes, um, which could you know, potentially include placing the water body in a different category of the 303D list or delisting or a refinement of the listing assessment against the new thresholds. 
There's one point where we would like to ask for confirmation. And specifically, we would like to ask for confirmation that the finding means that a site-specific objective or use attainability analysis will not be required to reevaluate the listing of Los Gatos Creek for temperature. And with that, we thank you very much for um, the efforts in, in helping us find a path forward. Thank you, Ms. Paulson. Uh, understand the concerns here. Um, I, I think just I, I would point out some of the points I know staff made when it comes to the general lack of data we have uh, across a number of our, our, our watersheds, particularly around these, uh, these protections. But then also uh, that the 303D list does not automatically then impose upon uh, any sort of you know, regulatory and, and is a always evolving process and open to new data in deed listings, obviously. Mr. Uh, Bishop, anything uh, you'd like to add there? I'd just like to make the confirmation that uh, <clears throat> that this is a, um, the criteria used to assess the temperature is not a water quality criteria in the basin plan. So it does not require a um, site specific objective to address it. Um, if the um, peer reviewed study is uh, agrees that there is a different uh, criteria for the steelhead in that uh, watershed for temperature, then that criteria can be applied either off listing or at the next listing for um, evaluation against the data. Fantastic. And so I appreciate then the, the resources and uh, investment of time around trying to have a better understanding scientifically of the needs of, of our, our biological species and, and just the complex management of these watersheds um, and the reconciliation, not on, uh, to touch upon some of the discussion earlier today that we're doing here. I know Valley Water is committed to that and appreciate the, the discussion around the listing here. Any any questions from board members? I know this was uh, one uh, thing, you know, particularly uh, of interest of, for some of us here. Not hearing any, so then thank you, Ms. Paulson. And hopefully that, oh, uh, uh, not, not a question, but um, just a note of thank you to Valley Water for the collaboration. I, you know, I think we all appreciate it when a, an issue or a concern arises that our stakeholder work with our staff and bring forth an alternative, um, a path forward. And this is what Valley Water did. And I really appreciate that. Yes. Thank you, board member. And, and, and again, the, the finding then that makes clear uh, that no TMDL is going to be developed off of this. Again, this is kind of our, it's our flashlight. Uh, the 303D list kind of allows us to understand where we need to have actual further than discussion, uh, where there are impairments on this uh, sort of broader sort of uh, gut check level, I guess you can say in a way. Ms. Fitzgerald. Yeah, I was just going to chime in and um, suggest that we potentially display the change sheet language with this resolve. Um, but it also sounds like, um, you know, we're in a fairly good place with this right now. So um, I defer to you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm comfortable, uh, I think at this point, Ms. Paulson, or if you, you feel comfortable with the responses here, um, then uh, just thank you and we can move on. Then. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Paulson. Uh, okay, well, fantastic. Uh, then next uh, we'll move to uh, David, uh, Hoshell, sorry, I'm gonna probably not get your last name right, I apologize. Oh no, you got it uh, the I way did. I pronounce okay. it, which is not the correct pronunciation from the original Austrian German. So oh. <laughs> I don't get it right myself. So thank you very much. Good to see you. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I urge you to support the Regional Water Board's uh, proposal uh, to declare uh, Los Gatos Creek as impaired for temperature. Uh, because it is. Um, the Los Gatos Creek comes down cool and clear from the Santa Cruz Mountains and historically supported large populations of steelhead and salmon. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the reservoirs and other obstacles have dramatically imp uh, impacted the water temperature in fish populations. Uh, the creek runs through the cities of Los Gatos, Campbell, and San Jose. And I just want you to know that as a local resident, I know there's tremendous interest in protecting and restoring the remaining natural resources. Uh, we, we had a huge amount of media attention with return of a few beavers to the creek. 
Uh, and um, I've been one of hundreds of volunteers interested and willing to go out and count uh, the few salmon that are trying to make their runs uh, in the creek. Um, but there is a real potential here, uh, but, but the, you know, for some healthy runs, but the water is just too warm. Um, if we could uh, just get the water source from the bottom of, of the Sumna Reservoir and make some other minor improvements, um, we could have, you know, a real thriving uh, population of anadromous fish, uh, which would be welcomed by thousands of residents uh, of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I, I heard, I didn't come here to debate uh, with Valley Water, but I heard Ms. Paulson reference uh, the FACE agreement that uh, she's concerned that might be um, impaired or, um, you know, delayed if, if, if they have to look at the temperatures here. I would remind you that the, the FACE agreement um, was um, drawn up almost 20 years ago, or maybe it's been 20 years ago, and Valley Water still doesn't have an EIR, okay? So um, I just would urge you to, to move forward uh, and recognize that, um, you know, whether you've got some good data now, I, I'm all for collecting some good data, figure out what, what it uh, really is right, and, and if the steelhead uh, can tolerate a little warmer water here in um, the South Bay. You know, I'm all for the science, but I don't think that that should um, delay moving forward. So I, I, I want to thank you for your time and your interest. I appreciate it. That's thank all you, I have. Really appreciate your comments today. Thank you, Mr. Koshal. Uh, then last we have Caitlin Kalua. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Well, Doing well. Wonderful. Uh, Caitlin Kalua, Policy Manager uh, with the California Coast Keeper Alliance, which represents local California waterkeeper organizations, both inland and along the coast. Uh, just a few general comments to make uh, today. So I appreciate being the final comment. Um, just a general comment to say that we appreciate um, ju just this general update to the integrated report and the large effort undertaken by your staff. Um, California waterkeepers, including Yuba River waterkeeper, and Coachella Valley uh, Waterkeeper appreciate that a number of waterways and river segments were actually added to the 303D impairments list, um, which then allows these waterways to receive the full, full protections uh, afforded by the Clean Water Act and to address ongoing impairments you know, to restore these waterways. Um, overall, we do remain concerned that nearly 95% of all waters assessed in California based on this data in this report, um, excluding ocean waters are listed as impaired yet only a handful of TMDLs have been approved despite this being a flashlight to address over 1400 impairments with many more proposed yet unaddressed in the last two decades. As one example, the dioxin PCB TMDL for Humboldt Bay was scheduled in 2006 to be completed in 2019, yet no progress has been made. We urge the water boards generally to prioritize ongoing monitoring and to impose TMDLs to ensure that water quality is actually improved and objectives are set and achieved. Second, and to briefly reiterate comments uh, heard earlier today, as the Water Board continues this work, we urge and encourage hydro modification and flow impairments be included as an important tool to identify and address rivers impa impaired by poorly timed or entirely too low of flow. Uh, California can and should join other arid western states in including hydro modification listings to protect flow impaired waterways. With current threats, including possible rollback of federal regulations of Section 401 water quality certifications, um, the State Water Board should prioritize listing rivers for hydro modification and flow impairments to strengthen future 401 certifications issued by the board and to strengthen the board's overall efforts to address flow impairments. Finally, across the state, uh, there is a reliance of too old and too little of data. And as was previously mentioned that while the public can play an important role in providing this data, this burden really cannot be borne on the public alone. We encourage the state to conduct uh, targeted assessments to collect current and accurate data and to additionally seek partnerships such as within academia to fill in the needed data gaps to inform the 303D list. We and the local water keepers um, look forward to continuing to engage in future iterations of in future cycles. We also look forward to continuing um, in the ongoing development of the statewide biostimulatory policy to address nitrogen and phosphorus uh, pollution that degrades numerous California waterways in that way. You know, ultimately urge the that 
that biosimilatory policy be, you know, prioritized and completed. And overall, just thank you for the comment and appreciate the work that's being done. Thank you so much, Ms. Kalua. Really appreciate the continued good uh, collaboration, I know, on all these, these issues. So thank you. Uh, any further questions or thoughts from fellow board members? Hearing none, I could entertain a motion. And flag, I think there are two change sheets as part of that. Yeah, I think so, one <clears throat> point of clarification, uh, if there is a motion, is that it's one change sheet that there were revisions that were displayed on the screen and described by Ms. Fitzgerald. Correct. Oh, okay. We'll move for adoption of this item with the one change sheet and the revisions read into the record by Ms. Fitzgerald. I'd like to second and uh, thank you, Board Member Dodek, for uh, your compliments to Valley Water. And I just uh, would like to chime in as well and thank the stakeholders for uh, working with our staff and to thank our staff. There were some last minute discussions and I think we landed in a good place with further clarification. So with that, I'll second the motion. Thank you both. Uh, Ms. Townsend, can you please call the roll? Yes. Board Member Dodek? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. And the vote carries and the uh, lists are adopted. So thank you so much, Ms. Fitzgerald, for and every all the incredible staff, Ms. Weber as well. I know that are uh, just incredible. Thank you. Process improvements, data management. It's uh, it continues to be uh, fantastic to see us catching up here on the integrated report and and using new tools and systems to try to manage what is an incredible uh, data intensive exercise. And thanks again for everyone's good comments and today's discussion. I thought it was. Uh, very, very well, uh, well, well done. So thank you. With that uh, leads us to a lunch here. Um, so let's go ahead and take our lunch and uh, we will then uh, resume with item number seven. Um, it is a, a critical matter uh, regarding uh, adjudication of potentially the, the Fresno River here. So let's go ahead and um, we'll meet back up, say, uh, I'll give us a 35 minutes. Uh, so generous this today. Uh, so 1.30, we'll all, we'll all come back together here and we'll continue on with item number seven. Thank you everyone for a productive morning and see you very soon.
Hello, everyone. It's 1.30. I think we can start to gather ourselves back. All right. That now brings us to item number seven. And item number seven here is a consideration of a proposed resolution granting a petition by Madera Irrigation District for the statutory adjudication of water rights in the Fresno River watershed. I'd like to thank, I know this is a follow on item now from a discussion and board meeting, I think well over uh, about a year ago, I believe. And just wanna thank everyone's good work and look forward to hearing this update and the discussion ahead. You know, it's been a long while since we've really undertaken the work of a statutory adjudication like this. And so uh, just appreciate it. So with that, I'll turn it over to staff. It seems we have Mr. Eric Eckfeld here, Hi, head of the Division of Water Rights. Good to see hopefully you. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, we Looks can. Like Great. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Esquivel, and good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Eric Eckfeld. I'm the Deputy Director for the Division of Water Rights. Today, the division brings before you a resolution and a consideration to adopt a petition by Madera Irrigation District to conduct a statutory adjudication for the Fresno River. The uh, actions that we're bringing forward before you today are relatively novel in a sense and relatively not novel in another sense. Statutory adjudications are something that the board or its predecessor have done many times over the last 100 years or so. However, it's not something that we've done recently. And in fact, this is the first statutory adjudication that we're considering in the last 40 years. And so a lot has changed over the last 40 years. Uh, many of those things that have changed are going to make it, I think, easier for us to move forward more quickly on a statutory adjudication. The changes that we've seen in terms of uh, computing and just being able to make information more easily available to stakeholders and others will in general greatly help the process as we go forward. But because this is also the first time we've done this in 40 years, there are new things to consider, uh, new offices to consider and how we could potentially integrate them. And the process itself will need to be very carefully thought out and uh, messaged and made very clear that, that the process is public and available for people to weigh in throughout the entire process. The uh, presentation we are shortly going to turn over to staff. We have multiple staff here today. Uh, Connie Mitterhofer and Jesse Jankowski will provide a brief background document for uh, the board to review. There are participants from the Office of Chief Counsel, including Amanda Pearson. Uh, Diane Rill from the division is also available to answer questions as they emerge. We also have a number of participants uh, related to stakeholders and water users in the Fresno River watershed itself. And I believe that those stakeholders have formed two panels that will also offer comments on the process and the board's consideration of whether or not to adopt the petition. So with that, I wanna turn it over to staff and we will go from there. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Eric. Um, this is Connie Mitterhofer. Um, I'm having a little bit of some connection issues, so I'm going to try to leave my video off um, for the main part of my presentation and uh, try to turn it back on later. Uh, so good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Um, thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Before we get started, I also wanted to acknowledge Lisa Hong and Michael Buckman in the hearings unit and the IT folks that have invested a significant amount of effort into the project today. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows an outline of our short staff presentation today after providing background information on statutory adjudications and the pending petition. We will summarize the efforts undertaken since 2019, the rationale leading up to the staff recommendation and the comments received to date. Next slide, please. A statutory adjudication is a proceeding by which all of the water rights in a stream system are determined through an administrative proceeding conducted by the State Water Board and confirmed by entry of a decree by the Superior Court. 
a statutory adjudication may be initiated by a claimant through a petition to the board and the board may either grant or deny the petition after evaluating whether the adjudication would serve the public interest and necessity. I just also want to point out that the slide is somewhat misleading as in the process looks fairly short and simple when in fact it's quite lengthy, multi-phased approach with multiple rounds of noticing. So after an extensive noticing period, board staff conducts a stream investigation, uh, basically a field investigation of existing uses and water users submit proofs of claim to the board. The adjudication also provides an opportunity to evaluate public trust resources and the flows necessary to protect those resources and meet applicable water quality standards. The information collected during this process is used to prepare a report of investigation and a preliminary order determining the water rights to the stream system. Water right claimants have an opportunity to object to the report and preliminary order, and by doing so, they can participate in one or more hearings on objections. After those hearings have been completed, the board adopts a final order and following a reconsideration period, the board then files a copy with the court. The court may hold its own hearings to hear challenges and enter a and, and finally enters a decree that acts as the final determination of water rights. Our project website contains a fact sheet with more detail on the adjudication process. Next slide, please. So the next few slides provide a roadmap and timeline for the past two years. Um, Madeira Irrigation District submitted the petition for a statutory adjudication of the Fresno River in October 2018. Um, the slide also shows a map of the Fresno River watershed with the blue outline in the middle being hidden dam and the black dots representing the no known points of diversion on the main stem Fresno River and the tributaries. The estimated 300 water guide claims um, do not include unexercised riparian claims, which would also be included in an adjudication. Next slide, please. At the September 2019 board meeting, the board adopted a resolution postponing action on the petition and giving the parties an additional eight months to negotiate an alternative settlement and reduce the need for large-scale adjudication. The resolution outlined eight criteria which the settlement should meet to address the issues raised in the petition, as well as seven milestones to assess progress. Initially, parties were, ret were to return to the board in May 2020 to present a proposed settlement and demonstrate progress towards the milestones. That timeframe was later extended to September, October 2020. The board's 2019 resolution also directed staff to investigate water rights and claims along the lower Fresno River and make those results publicly available and to investigate funding for facilitation services to aid the parties in their negotiations. With the next slide, I am now turning the presentation over to Jesse, who will provide an update on both of those items. Thank you, Connie, and good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and board members. So as Connie mentioned, the State Water Board's Resolution 2019-0049 directed staff to conduct a preliminary investigation of water rights and claims to the lower Fresno River, so the main stem of the river between Hidden Dam and the San Joaquin River. The results of this investigation were released in early December 2019 to the parties and to the public. This investigation was a, a compilation of publicly available water right and land ownership information. It was not a legal determination of water rights. And we also offered parties and the public opportunities to comment or provide corrections to the investigation findings. More recently in July, in cooperation with the Division of IT, we released an interactive map uh, called the Fresno River Investigation Geodatabase, which showed the results of the investigation in an interactive format. This is a screenshot of the geodatabase below, and this shows points of diversion and places of use for licensed and claimed water rights to the lower Fresno River, as well as riparian properties, which may have a potential unexercised riparian water right to the river. Next slide, please. 
As Connie also mentioned, the board's resolution directed staff to investigate potential funding for a professional facilitator to aid parties in their negotiations. In late 2019, the board contracted with Kearns and West, a professional mediation firm, to conduct these facilitation efforts. The board was not a party to these negotiations that occurred in 2019 and 2020, though we received the final report on the mediation from Kearns and West in August. The report described the party's progress uh, on data sharing, identifying conceptual processes and proposals to move forward, but it shows a lack of consensus among the parties on the best way to move forward. And it lacks a firm quantification of water rights, water accounting protocols, and water administration terms. Parties to the negotiations, given the opportunity to endorse the report, though not all of them chose to do so, and some gave only qualified support based on various concerns. Those parties that did endorse the final report on the mediation requested six additional months to negotiate, though they recognized that the ultimate resolution of all issues in the Fresno River system would take longer than that. Next slide, please. In reviewing the report, staff acknowledges the progress that parties have made in identifying outstanding issues and proposing approaches for cost sharing, uh, hiring of a consultant, and, and various other efforts. But really the report identifies a number of outstanding issues which we feel would best be addressed by the involvement of the State Water Board. Many of these relate to making determinations on the quantity and priority of water rights, as well as terms for water management, water accounting, and water rights administration. Furthermore, the Madera Irrigation District, the petitioner, and the largest water user in the Fresno River system declined to endorse the report and to continue with negotiations. They feel that the negotiations did not meaningfully address all of the issues that the district raised in its petition for adjudication and renewed their request that the board conduct the adjudication. As a result, staff feels that further negotiations in the Fresno River system would likely be unproductive without the involvement of the district and further guidance from the state water board. Regarding the milestones and criteria addressed in Board Resolution 2019-0049, the final report on mediation describes that parties have met only two of the seven milestones that would be used to assess their progress. These were related to data sharing and identification of a facilitator, both of which were aided by staff's efforts. The parties also made partial progress on agreement on riparian acreages, though no final quantification was agreed upon. Of the criteria, zero were met by the parties for an ultimately successful settlement, though they made partial progress on the inclusion of all water users named in the petition. One of these named users did not participate in any of the negotiations. The involvement of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in settlement negotiations was also partial achievement of addressing public trust and water quality needs, though the parties ultimately did not agree on the flows that would be necessary to address these issues. Next slide, please. So as Connie mentioned, in evaluating a petition for statutory adjudication, the board must investigate facts and matters the demonstrating that an adjudication would serve the public interest and necessity. And the code of regulations gives an example of four of these criteria that the board should evaluate. The first is the degree to which the waters of a system are fully used. In the Fresno River system, the board has made several decisions throughout the past that determined that the Fresno River and its tributaries were considered fully appropriated for water right applications between the fall and spring. The second of these criteria is the existence of uncertainty about the relative priority of water rights to the system. In its petition, the Madera Irrigation District raises these significant issues over the priority of rights to the Fresno River system, including its potentially adjudicated rights, riparian water rights, senior appropriative rights, and the Bureau of Reclamation's license, as well as potential upstream riparian water users and stock ponds. The final report on mediation continues to acknowledge uncertainties about the relative priorities of these rights and raises the need for the board to make a determination on these priorities in order to proceed with the Fresno River system. The third of these criteria is the unsuitability of less comprehensive measures, such as private agreements or litigation to offer certainty to water right holders in the watershed. In the Fresno River system, the State Water Board has acted multiple times in the past, in the 1970s, the 1990s, 
and the late 2000s regarding the Bureau of Reclamation's water right for Hidden Dam. These board orders concerned the Bureau of Reclamation's obligations to certain water users downstream whose riparian water rights were quantified. However, the Madera Irrigation District's petition acknowledged that acknowledges that many conflicts still exist with these users and other users that were not previously addressed in the board's non-comprehensive measures. Furthermore, the past two years that have passed since the district issued its petition have demonstrated that private settlements and negotiations have not resulted in a meaningful resolution of Fresno River issues. The final criterion is the need for a system-wide decree or water master or both in order to ensure efficient and equitable allocation of the waters of a system. In the Fresno River system, the Madera Irrigation District's petition states that it has become the de facto water master of the Fresno River system as a result of the terms of the Bureau of Reclamation's license. The district has significant concerns with the position it's in with having to administer water rights without the legal authority to do so. Furthermore, the final report on mediation continues to acknowledge issues with the Madera Irrigation District's petition and the lack of an independent third party water master, which the parties endorsing the report have stated a clear need for. The board has also received a comment letter, and I think you'll be hearing some from some other parties regarding these issues today. So on the whole, staff do feel that a statutory adjudication of the Fresno River watershed would serve the public interest and necessity based on an assessment of these criteria. So with the next slide, I will turn it back to Connie to discuss the outreach that staff conducted on this matter. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so since receiving the petition in October 2018, staff has conducted a number of outreach activities, including the preparation and mailing of outreach packages to all known water right holders on the Fresno River. That was done uh, over a year ago creating a project specific website that uh, we have been keeping up to date, disseminating information through a uh, project specific virus list and presenting the results of the desktop investigation during one of the facilitated plenary meetings. And recently conducting stakeholder outreach meetings to provide project updates, share the preliminary staff recommendation and explain how the parties could participate in the board process. We have also separately reached out to and coordinated with the Pika Ewan Rancheria, the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Central Valley Water Board. Next slide, please. Since these slides were submitted, we actually received one additional comment letter. So the total number of letters received is um, 32. I will briefly summarize the comment letters. I understand that some of the commenters are here today and I would like to invite them to provide additional details. One of the comment letters we received was from Mr. Russell McLaughlin, uh, submitted a comment letter on behalf of the riparian water right holders he represents, acknowledging that while the parties made some progress, many outstanding disputes remain. The letter urged the State Water Board to grant the petition and proceed with the adjudication in a phased and structured approach, affording the parties an opportunity to negotiate and settle issues within each phase. The staff um, response to that is that the statutory adjudication process is outlined in the water code and is already a phased approach with multiple opportunities for the boards to share findings and for parties um, to litigate their water rights. There is not much um, flexibility in the statute beyond these provisions for a phased approach. And right now it's really not clear how the proposed approach would fit into the already existing process. Um, there's also a concern that the approach as proposed might add additional time and cost to the overall schedule and likely result in significant delay of completing the statutory adjudication. Um, one of the first steps after, if, if the board were to grant the petition today, um, would be for the investigation team to develop a work plan and time schedule um, uh, moving forward. Um, the second uh, letter we received was from a landowner group today representing seven water right holders on the Fresno River. Um, the main element in this letter is the request for the board to appoint a third party independent water master to manage releases for senior water right holders beginning with 2020-21 water year. 
The letter proposes to implement a cost sharing proposal set forth in the final um, mediation report. Um, staff response would be um, water masters are outside parties typically appointed by a court or by the Department of Water Resources to supervise diversion and use of water in a particular stream system. The State Water Board does not have the general statutory authority at this time to appoint a water master, um, but a court appointed water master is a potential outcome of an adjudication. The final court decree would address appointment of a water master after conclusion of the adjudication. Um, we also received two letters from Madeira Irrigation District um, urging the board to grant the petition, citing long standing disputes and increased use of surface water resources and a need to reach final resolution as to the priority and extent of water rights on the Fresno River. The letter concurs with the need for a system wide decree or water master service, citing shortfalls of the previously developed operations protocol and allocation model frequently called the FROB and the FRAM. In addition to that, we also received 28 form letters from landowners expressing support for the board to grant the district's petition. Next slide, please. So staff is cognizant and appreciates the hard work parties have invested in this process. While a lot of progress has been made, ultimately not all of the eight criteria and seven milestones laid out in the resolution were met. Additionally, there appears to be a recurrent theme of needing state water board guidance and leadership for the process to be successful, and staff believes that a statutory adjudication is the most appropriate pathway forward. As Jesse mentioned earlier, staff feels that a statutory adjudication in this case meets the criteria of public interest and necessity. Therefore, the staff recommendation is for the board to grant the petition and move forward with the adjudication. Also, an adjudication would not foreclose interim solutions or prevent further party negotiations and settlements being incorporated into a final decree. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And at this point, um, we are ready to take any questions you may have. And again, we understand that uh, we have several um, speakers today on the item. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm just incredibly impressed by uh, the work that's gone on in these last two years. Um, as uh, Deputy Director Ekdahl mentioned, this is the first uh, potential statutory adjudication that we would undertake in the last 40 years. When we talk about climate change and the impacts to our watersheds and the need to better manage what is already a limited resource in, in our communities, but going, growing even more limited and challenged, uh, are these uh, adjudications, these proceedings are, are even more critical because they help water users work out in a knowable and understandable way how best to share the resource in times of shortage who gets what, when. And also to Deputy Director Ekdahl's point, uh, the fact that we have mo more modern systems now, data systems and tools uh, will really help facilitate, I believe, and have for the first time uh, a real modern uh, water rights uh, statutory adjudication process where we can build trust and transparency. Everyone can see what everyone else is seeing, but really for the first time, uh, get a handle on reconciling the system that we have as it is to prepare us for the challenges that climate change undoubtedly is gonna have. So just uh, incredible thanks for uh, the good work here. Uh, I'm supportive of the staff recommendation. I, I'm looking forward to hearing from others in the community, but I think for the, the, the as well outlined when it came to the staff presentation, uh, I think now is the time to continue to move forward. And it, it's important to note that uh, voluntary efforts and negotiations can still go on as we proceed with the statutory adjudication and could benefit ultimately uh, if there is some voluntary solution that we do move forward, better understand simply the status of the, those water rights holders, provide the space and opportunity to, 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 to better suss out um, what folks feel they have claim to and, and settle out and, and from there better manage. The resource. So just thank you, uh, fellow board members. Any questions uh, as to what has been presented here? Again, I, I think we do have 
Um, here, let me get a sense of the number of commenters. Um, it looks like about eight. Um, and so, uh, but board members, any questions or comment? Okay, well then we can move on and uh, listen here to uh, the, the good input from uh, many of the local stakeholders that have been engaged with staff and appreciate the Madera Irrigation District's leadership in petitioning the board, understanding that there is a challenge here when it came to management of the resource and a need to better understand the rights and that um, the that we can, uh, the, the trust that it takes as well to petition. So I appreciate that and would call up then, uh, it looks like we have a first panel of uh, three individuals from the Madera, Madera Irrigation District. And so uh, Mr. John uh, Kinsey, Oh, and yes, and everyone is, is in the room there with us. Good afternoon. So glad that you can join us today. Good afternoon. Yeah, we just have a brief presentation for the board today. I'm Thomas Gracie, the general manager here at Madera Irrigation District. With me today is Dina Nolan, the assistant general manager, and our legal counsel, John Kinsey. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I have just a brief introductory slide, a little reminder of who we are. I can't believe it's been about a year since we last saw you. And then we do have a couple slides regarding the public interest and necessity that we'll go through and some closing remarks. And perhaps more importantly, we're available for questions if the board or staff has them. So if you could advance the slide, we'll get started. So in summary, Madera Irrigation District is a public agency. We're an irrigation district. We represent about 100,000 acres of ag land, but the district itself covers about 140,000 acres of land here in Madera County. We also encompass the city of Madera, which is really the heart of our district, and it's a disadvantaged community, along with other small rural residential homes and disadvantaged communities located throughout our district. The ag component of our district includes a number of small family farms, 20 acres to very large corporate operations. But I have to say, we do really maintain that small multi-generational uh, farming operations that have been here for, for generations and want to see that continue. Our overall mission and what we utilize our water supplies for is to obtain and manage affordable surface water and groundwater supplies in a manner which will ensure the long-term viability of irrigated agriculture in the district. So that's just a reminder of who we are. We represent all of our growers and constituents as a public agency. And I'll hand it over to Dina regarding the public interest and necessity. Hi, next slide please. Um, so this information has been conveyed to the state board um, through various communications from the district over the past few months. But we did just want to reiterate that we truly believe, um, just from MID's experience, that the public interest and necessity will be met through this process and particularly related to the four criteria. So um, just to briefly go over those again, um, the degree to which the waters of the stream system are fully utilized. Uh, the Fresno River water is fully utilized at this point. Um, additional parties have recently claimed rights, and we have the expectation that more parties, greater acreages, and greater demands will continue. So that makes managing the system extremely difficult the way it's currently set up, and that's one of the impetus for the, the need to file the petition back in 2018. Um, going on, the existence of uncertainty as to the relative priorities of the use of water um, within the stream system. Again, this has been documented um, throughout the petition and even the Kearns and West report. But there are many different water rights within the Fresno River system that include both riparian water, appropriative water rights, pre-14, and even the unexercised water rights. So really trying to identify the use of the water and priorities of those waters within the system is a goal for the district. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the unsuitability of a less comprehensive measure, such as private litigation or agreements, um, the district has for many years, and it seems to be a reoccurring theme about every decade or so, um, where you know different efforts are utilized to try to come to some resolution. Um, this includes, but it's certainly not limited to, the State Board Order 99-001, um, the 2011 licensing proceedings, and then just recently the facilitation mediation process. Um, so the district feels as if those kind of less comprehensive measures have been exhausted to date and that really the need for state board involvement um, is required at this point in time. And then finally, the need for a system-wide decree or water master service. Um, again, as is evidenced by um, many of the history and documentation throughout the years, um, complaints, legal threats, different things that 
MID nor any entity can effectively perform the role in the absence of a system-wide decree. Um, so there's numerous foundational issues that are um, still unresolved and the State Water Resource Control Board would really be the best to, to help us resolve those. So next slide, please. So the goals of filing the petition, um, this was actually presented to the State Water Resource Control Board last year and was truly the goals of MID when filing the petition back in 2018. And those goals remain the same. Um, the district really liked the lawfulness of operations and water use for the Fresno River. Certainty going forward for not only MID, but also those landowners um, who are affected by this process. Um, the reduction of disputes and to really achieve a final resolution for the system and ensure the most beneficial use of water and prevent the waste of water in the Fresno River system. So with all of those in mind, um, MID fully supports the staff board's recommendation for granting the petition. And next slide, please. So in closing, I just would like to take a moment on behalf of the Bedaria Irrigation District and our growers to thank the state board for providing resources towards this topic. I'd also like to thank your staff for their excellent work and hard work related to the last few years and, and prior years and working uh, with us to move this process forward. We do look forward to moving on to the next phase of the process and our board, which is made up of multi-generational farmers who are looking out for the best interest of all of our constituents are fully committed to this process, including consistency with the mission of our district. So with that, I just uh, thank you again for that and, and we'll, we'll move on for the next process. Thank you. Just really want to acknowledge and thank you again, the leadership of the district in all of this and uh, just having uh, very uh, clear uh, goals and intentions here and helping us provide the trust to engage in what is very difficult conversations when we talk about how we, we best manage our water resources amongst many competing uh, users and, and uses, but uh, also with the, the, the threats of, again, declining uh, water uh, hydrology uh, with climate change and all the threats that we have. And if not for the leadership of uh, local districts, local individuals, uh, we're not able to uh, do this work or it comes at greater cost and uh, a lot more wasted time. And I think that's where we're best. I wanna also acknowledge your leadership around just a sense of urgency that we've exhausted other measures and that being able to move forward here and still uh, you know, with, with opportunity to, 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 to um, accept voluntary agreements should, should they meet these criteria, but really just moving forward with the work and recognizing that we need to have a, a forum and a place uh, to, to just work out who has best claim to what and how to best share it. So just, again, I, I can't thank you enough for your, for your leadership there. I don't have any real question at this point, but um, would open up to my fellow board members to see if uh, there are any questions or, or comments. Vice I Chair? Just have, yes, uh, I just want to thank uh, staff and uh, the stakeholders um, in the watershed for all of the good dialogue. And I'm just um, really looking forward to kind of using this as a test case. Um, it looks like we have some, you know, hopefully some narrowly defined issues. And um, I, I share in your comments, uh, Chair Esquivel, about the transparency and it's just exciting to see that so far there has been transparency and open dialogue and hopefully that will continue. And I'm just still um, a, a bit hopeful about um, a, a negotiated solution that may emerge um, in the meantime. But if not, I think we will roll up our sleeves and be ready to go. Thank you, Vice Chair. And then what I <clears throat> do wanna make sure to acknowledge is I do see it as a continuum of work. Um, you know, one doesn't uh, you know, somehow uh, uh, negatively impact the other. And instead it is a continuum of a discussion based off of simply uh, the facts as they may present themselves. Who has uh, water rights and access to what? What is naturally hydrologically available? How do we put, protect our public interest? And then, you know, settle out there in incredibly difficult um, work. But I think if we can commit ourselves to the continuum that, you know, this, this more sort of, I guess you could say more regulatory side of the work, the statutory adjudication that we're called to do does actually fuel and provide then the basis for any voluntary or negotiated settlement therein. But uh, it is that continuum of work. And it's uh, the commitment to simply having that honest dialogue and having a trust around that data and knowing that that's really 
difficult in of itself because uh, there is disagreement oftentimes. And that's what the statutory adjudication process is here to help uh, settle out. So, um, so thank you, uh, Vice Chair, for that comment. And, and thank you again to the district for the leadership. And uh, we can move on to, I believe, what is a, a second panel here. Um, and I think uh, composed of Mr. Douglas Jensen, Jennifer Spalletta, and Andrew Ramos. And at this point, all of those panelists should have control over their microphones and camera. So we are at your mercy at this point. Good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and board members. Um, this is Andrew Ramos. I, I will kick off the panel and then I will turn it over to my colleagues, Ms. Spalletta and Mr. Jensen, if that's okay. So as I said, good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and board members. My name is Andrew Ramos and I'm an attorney at Barkowitz, Chronic and Shanahan in Sacramento. My client is the Adobe Ranch and the ranch's agricultural history at the Fresno River dates back to the 1850s. It's the first diverter downstream of Hidden Dam and it relies on its senior water rights and MID irrigation water, it's actually an MID customer, for beneficial uses at the ranch. The ranch is one of seven growers that signed a comment letter to you uh, back on September 28th and it participated in the negotiations over the last year that recently ended. Thank you for that opportunity and thank you to the, for the staff resources that you've committed over the last year to helping us move this process forward. What I want to address today is not so much the decision to adjudicate and grant MID's petition, but your decision about how the river will be operated during the adjudication. And I think it's helpful to note that according to MID, there is no substantial dispute between MID and my client about the extent of Adobe's riparian lands. Yet MID and Adobe have spent years now engaged in one dispute after another about riparian water entitlements as determined by MID. And those disputes resulted in MID deciding in January of 2019 to unilaterally cut off my client from receiving any riparian entitlements for that year, a decision that would have been without precedent and would have been devastating to the ranch. The only reason that that did not happen was that State Water Board staff investigated and warned MID to rescind its decision or face an enforcement proceeding. And again, this dispute occurred without a significant underlying water rights dispute between MID and Adobe about the extent of Adobe's riparian rights. Rather, it was the result of the present status quo on the river, that MID is both the most significant water right claimant by far and the river's de facto water master. When the board granted water right license 13836 to the Bureau for Hidden Dam, it included a term requiring the Bureau and MID to develop protocols, the FROP and the FRAM, that were referenced earlier, that ensure downstream senior right holders' needs would be satisfied by MID through river releases. In the time since then, MID has used that authority to deny water entitlements to senior users, the results of which have been more water becoming available for MID as a junior right holder under the license. Now you've heard from other parties that you should maintain the status quo during the adjudication. But as you heard from the group of growers in our comment letter, the status quo means MID wielding the water entitlement system for its own benefit, keeping users from receiving entitlements through improper use of the protocols. And that's why I'm here speaking to you today. Our group is asking you to require that a neutral third party administer the river system during the adjudication. This is not asking for appointment of a water master per se, but replacing MID in the role that you created for it under license 13836. And our point is it's simply not appropriate to maintain the status quo and leave one of the adjudication parties in charge of other water users entitlements while we're engaged in potentially years of adverse proceedings. Again, license 13836 gave MID through the Bureau the authority over river releases and entitlements for senior users like my client. The board therefore is the only body with the authority to fix the current status quo and put the parties on fair footing during this adjudication. We ask too that you provide for a dispute resolution mechanism and interim relief for water entitlement issues during the adjudication. Adobe's own experience in 2019 shows the necessity of quick board intervention when the rules are not applied. Please consider referring such matters to your administrative hearing office for hearing and interim decisions regarding relief. That office would be well equipped to hear these disputes and make interim decisions 
that could then be adopted or reconsidered by yourselves as part of your final action on the adjudication. Please also consider expressly authorizing your enforcement team to investigate and work to resolve these matters during the adjudication. You know, as was discussed earlier, past adjudications have taken many years, sometimes decades. And we're hopeful that an adjudication in this case will be able to proceed much faster. But if it doesn't, interim relief is necessary. Thank you again for giving the parties an opportunity to try to reach a negotiated solution for the many issues facing the Fresno River. Uh, my client spent many hours on the negotiations and it too was disappointed when these discussions did not resolve enough issues to prevent an adjudication. Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments and my fellow panelists, Ms. Paletta and Mr. Jensen will speak now and then we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hello, this is Jennifer Spoletta. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, Chair and fellow board members. Um, I am a principal with Spoletta Law and I represent two landowners who are downstream of Hidden Dam. They're actually relatively far west on the system, west of Interstate 5, um, but prior to where the river joins with the San Joaquin River. And that is the East Family Farms and Tri East Dairy. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity just to kind of explain my client's circumstances and why we support you granting the petition and also why we support um, having some type of interim remedy and potentially an independent water master in the meantime. My clients own two different ranches, one of which is a ranch that has never been irrigated from the Fresno River in recent years and does not have a current point of diversion on the river. We completely understand the need to go through the adjudication process um, as long as it is relatively timely in order to resolve any outstanding issues with that ranch. The other ranch, however, is a ranch that was actually included in the FRAM back in 2010 and 2011 and has historically received water from the Fresno River um, through the prior owners of the ranch and then actually currently my clients continue to take water at that point of division to serve the ranch but they do so by buying it from MID. So my clients have actually had a very good relationship with MID as far as the supply of water. However, now it's a matter of characterizing what right that water is associated with, whether they're receiving stored water from MID or whether they're properly exercising a riparian right. And that relates to how frequently they can get the water and in what priority and whether or not they have to pay for it. So my clients need to have some certainty on these issues because of Sigma and the looming allocations in the Madera subbasin. So they're all growing crops, some of them permanent crops, and there of course is a need to achieve that kind of certainty. Many other landowners are in a similar position. So we support you granting the petition for the adjudication. We think there are plenty of issues that need to be decided. We um, respect MID's decision to file it and we understand why they did. Like I said, my clients have a very good working relationship with MID, but adjudications can take a very long time. And so there is a need for some type of interim relief uh, between now and the time this issue is completely decided and you have a court decree. And we actually think that providing a mechanism for interim relief um, will actually lead probably to some settlements that will be brought to you for different interests and stakeholders along the river that then could be incorporated into your final decision. So we'd really urge you to um, embrace that opportunity with your staff and think of creative ways that that could occur through use of the administrative hearing office. We think that's a really good idea. Um, so with that, I wanted to just see if you had any questions for me. I also wanted to compliment your staff on doing a good job with their desktop investigation, being so transparent and being accessible to the parties. We think that frankly, your staff has moved the ball forward significantly already for this process and that the mediation, even though it didn't result in a settlement, also moved the ball forward and you have some really good people working on this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Spalletta. And I know there, I'll, I'll let Mr. Jensen speak and then I do have a, a few comments and questions. So thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Um, 
My name is Doug Jensen. I'm with the firm of Baker, Manick and Jensen in Fresno, and we represent Costa View Farms, uh, one of the senior water rights holders on the river. First, let me thank you as others have done, but for allowing for the mediation and especially for the staff assistance that has been rendered to us. Staff has always been available to help with arrangements, but more importantly, to discuss the concerns that we've got. And I'd like to jump into that because uh, as others uh, have mentioned, there is a true uh, history here. Um, our client, as I say, Cost of View Farms uh, and a number of other growers and senior water rights holders uh, have had disputes with Madera Irrigation District uh, about its operation of the river ever since the commencement of the Hidden Dam project. Uh, immediately after the Bureau of Reclamation filed its application to store Fresno River water, uh, John Salaberry, among others, filed objections. Uh, he was concerned about his senior water rights, not only riparian, but also his own license. He was uh, assured that his senior rights would be honored. Um, and then he and his family and MID uh, did not agree on, on those rights and the quantification thereof. Eventually his family sold their ranch to the Costa family. Um, and as you might expect, the, the dispute came with the land. Um, ultimately, uh, we thought we had, well, we reached a settlement of those disputes, but MID has now renounced that agreement. In other words, we thought that we had already achieved the certainty that has been mentioned before. Uh, if you grant the petition of MID to adjudicate the entire river, we ask that you withdraw from MID any authority you have granted it to administer the Fresno River and act in effect as its water master. And there's been earlier comment on the compliance review and licensing process that was concluded by your board in 2011. Um, as uh, a result of that compliance review and the license, uh, your board instructed um, the Bureau, whose license was at issue, and MID, which was the intended beneficiary of that permit and license, to release sufficient water down the Fresno River to uh, satisfy the prior rights of named riparian owners and Cost of View Farms was among those named. You also required the Bureau and MID jointly and with those other prior rights holders to develop the Fresno River operations protocols uh, to operate the river while respecting the prior rights of downstream owners. There were long negotiations uh, during the compliance review process uh, and right at the end of the process by which you granted the license to the Bureau to establish the number of riparian acres that were inserted into the river model, the, the protocol, um, the parties to those proceedings, including MID, MID, agreed on the specific number of riparian acres uh, to be irrigated from the Fresno River by Costa View Farms. And that number was inserted into the protocols at that time. And that result, as I said, settled a decades long dispute between MID and the owners of the land in question. Um, in fact, all the parties to that, those proceedings were in accord. You granted the license to the Bureau um, and uh, the uh, Bureau received uh, that license, but also the instructions that I've mentioned before with regard to operating the model and to satisfying the prior rights uh, of those owners. Um, but MID unilaterally reduced the riparian acreage uh, attributable to our client and refused to deliver the Fresno River water in accordance with that formula. When our client objected, MID initially denied knowledge of the agreement, in spite of the fact, as I say, that the number of acres was inserted into the river model. Um, after we documented that agreement, MID simply ignored it and has reduced our allocation to less than half of that value. MID purported not to be determining water rights, but it certainly did prevent uh, a reduced water going to our client. Um, so MID is the beneficiary of this, the Bureau license, benefited from its revision of those 
Fresno River protocols. Um, the point that I'm trying to make about uh, the breaking of the settlement agreement is that MID has operated the river in a self-serving, not a neutral manner. And that's why we believe, as has been stated before, that a neutral water master is necessary. Uh, and we'd like to see some procedure to resolve the uh, complaints uh, and disputes with uh, MID in the interim, and perhaps the AHO might be helpful. We, uh, the Cost of View Farms participated fully in the mediation. Unfortunately, as been mentioned before, MID withdrew. There's been mention of keeping the status quo, uh, but the point is what status quo and my client is looking back to 1211 when your board granted the Bureau the license, gave the instructions and had the protocol in place. I'd be happy to uh, try to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you as well. I think, uh, thank all three of you on, on uh, the points made there. I think uh, obviously principle, uh, I think for me is, is the issue of what we do sort of in the interim. I had heard uh, from in the staff presentation we all did um, that uh, appointment of a water master in this moment is sort of less appropriate, but I'm willing to hear some discussion here, would like to hear from staff as to um, when it comes to utilizing the administrative hearings office, you know, or, and, and would acknowledge even though that um, there may not, I mean, the fact that there was a disagreement, you're able to come to staff and uh, it was resolved maybe means that the current, uh, if you will, status quo as, as to how we're treating any dispute resolution may uh, very well be working there. Um, so just, uh, I think I'd open it up to uh, Ms. Mitterhofer or um, uh, others, Ms. Pearson, it seems, uh, to uh, respond. Hello, thank you, Chair Escabel. Um, for some background here, it is very correct that initially we had not thought to make changes to the status quo while the adjudication proceeds. The reason for that is because the adjudication process is a very good tool for resolving disputes of this type that occur across the stream system. And if the board grants the petition, we will be on the path to that resolution. Uh, we have very much appreciated our discussions with the parties. We have, I think, a better understanding of what the interim disputes are and why there is a call for a means of resolving those disputes while the adjudication proceeds. Uh, we do not have a recommendation for handling interim disputes on the agenda for you today. We will continue to, you know, think our think over our options and see if we can come up with a process that is satisfactory to the parties, but also does not divert too much staff time or resources from the adjudication process itself. And we expect that at some point we will have a, a recommendation for the board regarding how to deal with some of those interim disputes. I appreciate that. And I think the, the key there is that the adju statutory adjudication process itself is meant to unearth and resolve these things. Uh, and that staff time and attention to either appointment perhaps, and that's where, again, it, you know, appointment of a, an interim water master or somehow some, some resolution here, I think it's just up for a little uh, additional discussion and look forward to you know, what, how we might use the administrative hearings office or otherwise to kind of help. But I think you know, the, the main point is that the, the, the focus and attention and resources are, are looking to be driven to the actual statutory adjudication process that will resolve them these things. So kind of creating further process uh, in the interim. And I think, again, there are, there are ways um, if issues arise, when issues arrive uh, in the years and time uh, during the adjudication that you know, can be brought to the board's attention and resolve um, in, in time there. So um, looking to, again, at a future uh, moment, have a little more detail as to what finer point options may be there, but um, I agree with staff generally here around what the status quo is then and maintaining that for the, the time being. Um, any, any thoughts or, or consideration from fellow board members though? I mean, I, I would agree with what the chair has said. Um, I certainly support 
granting the petition and moving forward with the process. But I would also suggest that we give direction to staff to come back to us at some point, whether it be three months, six months, whatever, um, and report on you know, proposals for dealing with interim uh, disputes after they've had a chance to discuss it with the um, with Mr. Lilly of the Administrative Hearing Office and bring us some options or at least, you know, a proposal without um, without just leaving it um, hanging without a, you know, a definite check-in date. Yeah, I appreciate that and, and would uh, ask, you know, as we still have a couple more commenters, but uh, from staff, just uh, when an appropriate timeline might be just on, on that, just so that, uh, Mr. Ractal. Yeah, if, if I can jump in really quickly, uh, one of the first, I think, orders of priority for staff, if the petition is accepted and we do move forward, is to do exactly as board member Dota uh, described, is put together a really concrete timeline of what exactly our workload and deliverables would need to be over, I think, a series of years. And inevitably, that's going to include how we are going to deal with uh, the hearings process that's going to be surrounding the preliminary order of determination, which is staff's initial recommendation. There's an opportunity for parties that have disputes there to specifically uh, request a hearing on that process. We've contemplated how the administrative hearings office could directly support that role or conduct those hearings. Uh, in starting to dig into these conversations, it immediately then brings up issues of ex parte and how we're going to balance staff workload and the AHO workload. Uh, we don't know the answer quite yet, exactly how we're going to balance it out, but that's one of the things that we need to do on our end. And I would fully uh, be more than willing and supportive of coming back in a couple of months once we've had the opportunity to devote staff resources to this process and describe a little bit more clearly how we think we're gonna do this and what opportunities we might have. Uh, and then the pros and cons of moving forward and some of those opportunities and what it might mean for, for that ex parte separation if it's there and the workload that comes later. I do also wanna note that uh, as Amanda noted, the timelines for moving, whether it's a complaint or some of these processes forward are still gonna be lengthy, uh, even if we use the AHO or not. And so that's also part of the consideration of whether or not we want to devote the staff resources to move forward with the adjudication that ultimately is driving towards the same set of resolutions as an interim solution might be. And that's all part of the, the process and the vetting that needs to occur. I think all that's appropriate. And um, I um, agree with board member Dodek. I'll just weigh in though, that I'm particularly interested in seeing how um, the Office of Administrative Hearings can uh, be utilized in this process, but don't feel so strongly that um, I'd want a, us to tie your hands in any way. So look forward um, to your recommendations on that issue in particular. Thank you, board members both. And hearing uh, probably sometime here uh, early in the new year, uh, it will be a good opportunity to, to check back in, an uh, informational item on some of the, the finer point thought on that. So thank you both. Uh, next, I would like to call, uh, call up Scott uh, Cooney. Good afternoon, Mr. Cooney. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board. Um, I'm Scott Cuny. I'm um, an attorney in the law office of Young Wooldridge down in Bakersfield. And uh, I have the honor of uh, serving uh, two clients that are involved in the Fresno River, the Triangle T Ranch and the Madeira Ranch One. Um, and we appreciate uh, the clerk of the board allowing us to participate in this process, albeit by Zoom, but it's good that we have a chance to speak with you directly and to provide you some um, of our thoughts on uh, how this process uh, has occurred and how it may occur in the future. Um, first, I wanna say, you know, from the very beginning of these proceedings, our office and Triangle T and Madeira Ranch have been fully supportive of the efforts uh, sponsored by the State Board to facilitate the parties 
in trying to pursue a negotiated resolution of the longstanding uh, disputes that relate to the Fresno River. And uh, we continue to, to believe that that is the preferred method, uh, ideally to resolve these water rights and management issues that exist. Um, but uh, of course, thus far, we haven't quite made it to our goal. Um, I, I also want to take a moment to, um, to applaud the State Board staff uh, for their creativity and encouragement to all of the parties when we met with the State Board in Sacramento uh, over a year ago to give the idea of can we perhaps pursue an alternative means of resolution. Um, again, it was uh, uh, very well received and encouraged by board staff. And I, I want you to know, I think this is something self-evident, but you really have assembled an extraordinary team that is uh, responsible for this Fresno River matter. They're all exceptional. Um, and we also appreciate you know, this board uh, likewise, having the creativity and making the investment, a serious investment of your time and of precious state funds to try to give this effort uh, a go. Um, and despite the best efforts, I think, of uh, board staff, of the board and of the parties, uh, we have fallen short of the mark. I think the, uh, the assessment given uh, by Mr. Jankowski and uh, Ms. Mitterhofer is exactly right. Um, it wasn't due lack of trying, but it is due to intractable uh, issues. Uh, it's a tough uh, set of problems on a, a, an admittedly a deficit system. And there's a number of parties, and that makes it even more, the ch more challenging. Um, in light of that, you know, we've ultimately concluded that um, unless there is a, a, a fundamental change in the structure and the dynamic uh, the process of settlement is not likely to be successful as it needs to be or timely successful. And so there really is no practical alternative, uh, but for what the board is doing here today, and that's to evaluate whether or not and under what set of conditions to accept the petition. Um, but notwithstanding that, and if you take that action, uh, we want to let you know that we are continually fully supportive as is our clients to remain committed to this notion of a locally developed uh, resolution, uh, but it needs to be uh, substantiated on legal principles. Um, it needs to be able to address all of the Fresno River matters. And we're very pleased to hear, and I've, I've heard it from State Board staff, and I think I've heard it from members of the board here this afternoon, that even though we may go forward in a statutory format, uh, there is a, an opportunity to at the right time and in the right manner based on legal principles and in consideration of all of the factors that need to be considered for such precious, precious uh, resources to integrate uh, what are maybe uh, solutions, local solutions that could be integrated uh, and brought before the board and you would make an assessment as to whether that's appropriate or not in the context of the adjudication process. We think that that actually can work um, it may be something analogous to uh, in your permitting process where there's an application and there's a protest and there's a matter of dispute. The parties work together and they present perhaps a resolution of that term and a, and a condition that would be appropriate and acceptable to the board. There may be something, uh, that's a rough analogy, uh, but I think there may be something like that that could occur here. And it will be uh, maybe a little bit groundbreaking because I don't think that's maybe how proceedings have uh, been administered previously, but we're here in a new day. So um, really those are the only comments that I have. Um, we recognize that this is a tough issue. This is an issue that is um, concerning a precious resource that is um, oversubscribed and we've got a lot of hard work and we need to roll up our sleeves and get our work done. If you have any questions that I can hopefully answer, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your, your good comment today. And uh, the acknowledgement of uh, the incredible rock star staff that we're fortunate to have on this project and at the board generally. Um, these are not easy issues, um, but their professionalism, their technical expertise, and their openness here, um, I'm glad shines through and appreciate that acknowledgement. And thank you. And, thank you. and appreciate then your contributions as well to this ongoing discussion and uh, affirm with you that it is a continuum of effort between the, the adjudicatory statutory processes that we have 
and potential solutions. And what it is about is the, the continuity of that information, those efforts, and, and making sure that we're all giving ourselves the best possible chance to continue to manage this challenged resource uh, here into the future. And, and that doesn't happen again, but for a lot of local leadership, first and foremost, and dedication to just the discussion based off of, um, again, fair legal principles and just a, a, a real need to have it based off of what's actually happening in the watershed and and uh, the trust that it creates. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the board. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Nancy Murray. And I will note that uh, both Nancy Murray and uh, Julie Vance, uh, colleagues uh, from sister agency at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, you marked if only necessary. So if necessary, here's a moment. Right, thank you, Chairman. And and again, we just, um, Julie Vance, who is the regional manager um, and I are available if there are questions from the board. Um, we were, CDFW participated actively in the, the negotiations and mediations, and we are supportive of the staff recommendation and here to answer questions if, if the board members have them. Thank you. And just want to acknowledge and thank your good work uh, with our staff in this process. And, and just thank you for being here and participating. Any questions from fellow board members from our sister agency? Hearing none. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And Ms. Vance, is there anything that you wanted to add as well? Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. That wraps up uh, our comment. Uh, and so thoughts, insights, feelings? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think everything that's needed to be said has been said already uh, thus far in the discussion. So I appreciate that. I think, you know, clearly this is following, following an intentional process to work through this really complicated matter of figuring out, you know, the history of you know water rights in the Fresno River, where there are differences of opinion amongst the water users, and you know what a forward-looking approach could be, and you know whether it's an, a full adjudication and going through that whole process, whether there can be a voluntary um, solution here in the interim um, and in the long term. Um, hopefully, we can see all of you know all of that come to fruition in a way that's not you know, too many years down the road, because I do understand there are needs now and there are concerns now. And so I, I like yourselves, other fellow board members, I look forward to hearing back from, from staff as to ideas as to how best to support um, equitable management of this river and it's respecting its water rights and previous board orders um, in the coming months. But, you know, beyond that, I'm comfortable moving forward today. Uh, with granting the petition, I would certainly support uh, approving that. Thank you, board member. Any thoughts from further folks? And otherwise would entertain a motion. I'll, I'll also move to adopt <laughs> the resolution. Second. Fantastic. Uh, Ms. Townsend, uh, roll call vote, please. Most certainly. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Board Member Firestone. Aye. Board Member Dodek. Aye. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. And the vote carries. And I just thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate, the, again, the good work that is being done here. And more soon, um, a lot more. Uh, and what I'll just say is that what I hope is that we do have, because we have modern tools and resources, something more of a speedier process. And hope that uh, folks can, can really uh, focus in on, on the effort and have some resolution sooner rather than later and not have a 10 or 15 year statutory adjudication, but maybe a five or six. Uh, well, with that, we now move on to board member reports, our last second to last item uh, prior to our executive director 
report. Board members, any any reports? I will start. I was able to uh, remotely participate in the San Francisco Bay and Central Valley Regional Water Board meetings. The, at the San Francisco Bay meeting, I'll just report one item. They um, every year issue a, a pollution prevention award, and this year it was um, it was um, awarded to the city of Berkeley for its effort to reduce waste and trash from um, uh, plastic containers, uh, disposable containers, I should say, you know, dealing with uh, restaurants and the food supply industry. So it was very good to see uh, the city where I went to college taking the innovative steps toward reducing trash and promoting the reuse of um, you know, the utensils and plastics, non-plastic uh, type uh, products. Um, and then with respect to the Central Valley Regional Water Board, if you'll recall, we adopted the um, Eastern San Joaquin order a while back. And part of that was the directive to develop a groundwater protection formula that would be used to develop ground protection values and then targets. So the Central Valley Regional Water Board received um, an update from staff as well as from uh, coalition members. And Ms. Dunham, who spoke earlier, participated in that and presented on the coalition's behalf a methodology um, that they developed based on something called the Central Valley Soil and Water Assessment Tool, CV SWAT. And you know, without getting into a lot of detail and getting ahead of the regional water board, which still needs to evaluate and approve it, um, I thought it, it was a very impressive report back demonstrating just the tremendous complexity and the amount of work that has been put into the process to comply with that order and develop the methodology. And it also very clearly highlights the work that remains in order to develop that protection, those values and those targets. But the coalition and staff and stakeholders are on it and you know, there seems to be um, making good progress. So I just wanted to share that with you. Fantastic, thank you board member. Any other? Board member reports. I'll just note that tomorrow is um, imagine a day without water, I believe. Um, and so that's a nice annual opportunity to think about, um, appreciate the value of water and water infrastructure and water providers <clears throat> throughout this, uh, the state and the country um, as part of a national effort. And um, I just think it's helpful to remind ourselves and take some time to share that um, publicly. Uh, but I don't have much to, I don't think I have really anything I wanted to highlight. Otherwise, it's a board report. So thanks. Thank you, board member. Yeah, I, I'll just uh, want to mention briefly that last week, I went to the uh, Sacramento Water Forum's 20th anniversary uh, celebration. And, um, you know, I a lot of my career, I was spent um, working for water agencies here in the in the Sacramento area and dealing with water management questions as it relates to you know sustainable use of groundwater uh, management of the American River um, for co-equal objectives of protecting our ecosystems and maintaining reliable water supply for all types of uses. And this is truly embodied in what you know we attempt to accomplish here on a grand scale at the Water Board. And so, you know, for me, it was important to go um, just to participate in that acknowledgement that, you know, Sacramento area and looking at the Sacramento River, the American River in particular, and its complicated operations and many, many water users in the urban setting uh, have really been remarkably successful in coming together um, with NGOs, um, with the Bureau of Reclamation, with um, you know, many, many water districts in this area to find uh, criteria to implement water conservation approaches to um, collaborate in terms of infrastructure investments um, to support conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater to establish a groundwater banking program 
you know, and these are all checks a lot of boxes, I think, for me personally, in terms of, you know, as we're preparing for climate change, and they had some projections that they shared uh, last week, uh, in terms of, you know, doing some, you know, detailed modeling in the American River watershed, and what types of impacts they're anticipating to see in the long run, in terms of climate change, changes in, um, <clears throat> in snowpack accumulation, rainfall patterns. So, it was just a good reminder that you know they've made a lot of progress. Um, there's other watersheds where I think that same potential exists, and I hope to see it uh, re be realized there too. And you know they also acknowledge that there's a ways to go, and you know the work is not done. Um, you know progress is good, um, and they want to keep that momentum and that spirit alive. So just you know again, it was it was I think a really good celebration of successes, and you know hopefully more to come. That's all. Thank you, board member. Um, I'll just report that um, uh, several weeks ago, I attended or participated in a Region 3's board meeting, provided a report, and then um, uh, listened for several days to uh, stakeholder um, uh, input on um, their upcoming uh, update to the Irrigated Lands Program. The, this is a program that they're calling 4.0. And there has been uh, such robust uh, dialogue over at Region 3 that um, the board is going to continue to discuss this at their upcoming meeting um, on September. I'm sorry, September. <laughs> I'm looking at my calendar here. Um, October 22nd and 23rd. So uh, for those of you who might be interested in that, I, I, I'll be following it um, on those days as well. And then. Um, I have been uh, having some discussions with staff regarding um, uh, Deer Mill and Antelope Creek. These are areas where in the last drought, our board adopted emergency uh, regulations and uh, really encouraging our staff to work closely with uh, local stakeholders, uh, water users, NGOs, and uh, the fishery agencies on seeing what can be done to develop uh, um, voluntary agreements, um, kind of planning ahead uh, uh, for drought, um, you know, in, in one of the many buckets that we're looking at. And I was encouraged uh, yesterday, uh, TNC reached out to me and wanted to update me on their desire to do just that. And so, um, uh, I just thought I'd report that to you and uh, hopefully in your discussions with staff and stakeholders, um, uh, you all would consider encouraging um, uh, similar efforts toward voluntary agreements. I'm really hopeful that uh, we won't have to have this come before us uh, by way of a regulation. Um, and if we do, um, that much of the discussions will have already taken place. So I hope to be able to continue to update you on any progress there. And then lastly, um, just because I wasn't at the last board meeting and didn't uh, get a chance to report in late September, um, I um, appeared before uh, California Chamber's uh, Water Committee. And um, uh, I know Director uh, Nemeth did as well. And uh, it, it was just a, a good opportunity to update them on um, some of the things we've been doing this year and uh, some of the key items uh, coming before our board. That's all I have. Thank you, Vice Chair. I appreciate the flag on uh, those issues and appreciate your work on that. Uh, I would only uh, mention actually something here in the future. Um, uh, next week on October 27th and 28th will be our yearly water quality coordinating committee meeting or WQCC. Um, it's in the water code. It's a yearly convening of all the water boards members. So all of our regional water quality control board members, our, our uh, state water board members will convene for two days and where previous years um, it was held in person uh, here in Sacramento. This year obviously will be uh, remote and uh, water quality coordinating committee was always noticed and available to be attended. And this will be the first year we will actually be convening virtually and everyone else, the public will be able to also attend, not unlike one of these, uh, one of our board meetings here. And so we look forward to that discussion next week um, some important topics that we'll be, we'll be discussing amongst ourselves as regional board members, but uh, a really good opportunity just to hear and to gather um, all uh, well over 
uh, 60 of us uh, that comprise the regional water quality control boards and here the state water board. So uh, looking forward to that discussion next week. Uh, that wraps up board member reports and I believe uh, takes us to our last item, uh, Executive Director Sobeck's report. Um, I don't have anything uh, specific to highlight unless anybody has any um, questions. And to note for others that the link in the agenda is there for the full executive director's report. Um, I don't have any questions, just always appreciative of what is an incredible amount of work that is going on in all the, the divisions uh, at the board and uh, the regions ultimately as well. So just appreciate that. But any questions from fellow board members on the executive director report? I had some questions and comments um, since we have a moment. Um, uh, you know, also, thank you. I always really appreciate <clears throat> the details um, that cover the huge breadth of work that the Water Board covers. Um, so one of the themes that I noticed in this uh, executive report was around um, reporting and, um, and enforcement a bit, and um, specifically, um, you know, there was a note about the volumetric annual reporting for um, wastewater and recycled water. Um, I think, you know, we we appropriately gave a um, significant extension for required reports for that with COVID. Um, but I, I think similar to that, um, there's, you know, I think 57 um, drinking water enforcement actions. Many of those are I think the majority of those are monitoring reporting violations. Um, and, you know, I think to me, this um, goes to just the need to make sure that the, that the water board is able to receive the reports and information that are required and that our regulations require um, from a variety of, of folks and that we're consistent in that um, uh, expectation and practice, um, you know, across the board. I know staff work hard to do that, and there's limited resources. But um, I think I just wanted to highlight that as, um, you know, often reporting doesn't feel like the most urgent uh, enforcement action <laughs> because of, um, you know, the uh, more immediate, um, concrete impacts. But I would like us to continue to just think about and and sort of send. Um, you know, look at the practices we can do to um, to increase compliance with reporting requirements and ensure that the board and therefore the public has access to, um, you know, the kind of data we need to um, implement our responsibility and um, protect water quality, drinking water, water rights. Um, and I that was just so that was one thing um kind of an overall theme that i saw and i would love you know i don't know executive director sobeck if you have thoughts on that um or if staff have been um thinking about that sort of across across different divisions well i think that um i think that we couldn't agree with you more that um we take reporting very seriously and you know if we don't if we don't if we ask for information because we think it's important, valuable, and essential, um, and we want to make sure that the information that we get is 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 used. If people don't report and we don't get decent responses, then our the information um, isn't as valuable, and and um, entities and individuals who have um, gone to the trouble to comply with our um, monitoring requests have provided information and, and spent time and energy um, collecting it and it might not be used and that's not fair to them either. Um, at the beginning or throughout the whole COVID emergency, we have received um, a number of requests about um, the time frame for um, reporting on various, on, on whatever it is, whether it's monitoring or any sort of reporting. And I think that we've, um, We've tried to be fair. We've tried to consider whether or not there it really is a hardship, and and um, how much of an extension is necessary, and whether um, we we've certainly um, tried to grant extensions if we think that um, you know uh, in individual health would be um, compromised for people having to um, 
comply with our reporting requirements or monitoring requirements. But I think in general, we have tried to not provide extensions and certainly not to, if, if it's extensions, just, uh, you know, not, not provide relief from reporting at all, but provide reasonable extensions if necessary. And I think that we've really tried hard to um, send the message that um, we expect that we really haven't suspended any of our um, requirements um, and that people need to go through the normal processes if they feel that they can't provide required information to us. And I think that we've generally speaking um, um, been successful in making sure that people do that. I, I think that as, as the board knows in a lot of different categories, getting people to report in a timely manner, whether it's reporting on um, you know, annual diversions in our water rights program or whatever the, or conservation um, uh, figures for, for water system, urban water systems, you know, that, that it's, it's a constant, um, it's a constant struggle to remind people about their obligations and, and for them to balance um, their obligations against everything else that's out there. But um, um, I think that we are, um, you know, generally, generally speaking, we are totally committed to keeping those reporting obligations, um, keeping them up to the mark. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say that we have an across the board um, approach, you know, they're being handled by different, different staffs in different ways, but I would say that we, um, we really are over time. And I, I guess I would use the um, water rights reporting um, system to, you know, we've, we've looked at places where, uh, where the reports reporting has been low historically and tried to work, work out ways to increase that response um, significantly over time. And I think we will continue to do that. Um, I, I'm, I can't promise that we'll do it for, you know, all reporting requirements everywhere <laughs> right away, but I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is really important and that we are looking at ways if there are specific areas um, that you all think need attention, you know, let us know and we'll, we'll be happy to figure out where that sits in your list and our list of priorities. Great, thank you. Um, and, you know, I think that my last comment was um, on this, on the report was just, I think one of the things is um, how, how, um, what's, uh, tracked and reported on in this report is helpful. I really appreciate it with water rights. Some of the, like the very transparent tracking of water rights applications and petitions and enforcement um, and, and sort of what's uh, gone to the new administrative hearing office, but just to be able to see those numbers, I know that's an area that everyone, all of us are, um, you know, looking at how we can improve efficiencies and address backlogs. Um, and so I really appreciate that, um, the way that that is, that information is shared. Um, I think, uh, yeah, and then I think just the, um, you know, to me it was pretty striking that there were, you know, 57 um, enforcement actions taken just in the last month on drinking water systems related to essentially primary drinking water standards. Um, even if it's monitoring reporting, that's pretty basic. We need to know what's, what is in the water that's being served. Um, so anyway, I think I, those were two things I just really appreciated the, the transparent reporting on that's available through these reports and um, I wanted to pull out, so thank you. Thank you, board member, for highlighting that and the attention around it. And I know, you know whether it's the electronic annual report on the drinking water side, or yes, data on uh, for water rights, et cetera. It is kind of those continuum of projects that are out there and just continuing to better understand when the opportunities are, whether again, it's the electronic annual report discussion or others when to uh, best help improve is important. So just thanks for your leadership on, on all that. Great, well, I think at that point, we're done with our board member reports and the executive director report. And that brings us to the end of today's agenda, which means we are concluded and this meeting is adjourned. Uh, our next meeting is November 4th, I believe. Uh, and a flag, and I should have flagged last time that we are starting now at nine o'clock, not 9.30. So uh, we will see you next 
uh, board meeting at nine o'clock. And I know many of you sooner than that and our various capacities. So just thank you everyone for the productive board meeting today. And we are now adjourned and thank you. <laughs>